Welcome to America's Day at the races on our Fox Sports 2 coverage. Good to have you with us. Program brought to you in part by America's Best Racing for the love of the race. Visit americasbestracing.net today. Getting set to kick off this card here in New York. About 20 minutes to post. So much to talk about. Big weekend coming up, including our ABR Race of the Week and one of the most important and prestigious races in the Distaff Division and the Apple Blossom, which we'll have a preview of coming up. And we're 23 days away from the Kentucky Derby. Greg Wolf, Sarah L. Bodwi, a lot to look forward to as we hone in on that first Saturday in May. And we're getting so much closer to really knowing all of the horses that are going to be competing in the Derby. Only one prep left that might have have some sort of say in who ends up in that starting gate, but we're really getting down to the wire with all of those contenders. Really looking forward to it. Well, let's get to our ABR race of the week. Coming up this weekend, we're going to have live on-site coverage in Hot Springs, Arkansas for this one. Greg one Apple Blossom, mile and a 16th, $1.25 million purse and wet paint. Coaching Club American Oaks winner from last year for Brad Cox and Godolphin. Tough spot to make your return and coming back off a five-month layoff for her four-year-old debut. And she's just a classy horse that was really showing up at the right time last year as a three-year-old. Her Kentucky Oaks maybe left you a little bit cold, but just what she came back to do, running well in this race to win against a horse that had every own way on the front end in Sacred Wish, ran well to finish second in the Alabama, and maybe you can excuse that Breeders' Cup distaff a little bit, a horse that likes to come from off the pace over a surface that was very kind to speed and facing those older fillies and mares as well. This is not the easiest comeback spot, but she's a good filly in her own right. And you'd be kind of surprised if you saw her coming back somewhere else, wouldn't you? I think they would have preferred to have a, a spot to get to this race before, but probably just didn't work out that way. But yeah, I don't think intentions were to come back first start of the year in a grade one might be later on in the year for her, but you knew that she was going to show up in some sort of stakes but race. Clearly, yeah, belongs <laughs> with these horses yes. in these races, but I'm sure they would have loved to prep. We'll see how she does uh, off the bench. It's a tough spot because of everyone who's lining up against her, most notably, look, at Dare Manor for Bob Baffert. Um, looks like she's going to be forwardly placed. She, at one point, reeled off five wins in a row, four of them graded stakes wins. She's just run faster races than a lot of her competition in this spot. And as you mentioned, she does figure to have that forward position in this race. And while she is trying to win her first race outside of California, and she didn't get the job done as the favorite last time, she still ran a 102 buyer in defeat behind the lightly raced Sweet Azteca. So you can't really hold too much against her. She is a horse with a lot of talent and ability, and she's going to have a tactical advantage on her main rival. It is one of the premier events in this distaff division year in, year out. We're going to have live coverage again coming up on Saturday from Hot Springs at Grade 1 Apple Blossom. So be sure and tune in this weekend to catch it all. we got some big action coming up today as well. We're going to get into this card about 17 minutes away from our opener here at Aqueduct. Let's take a look at what's ahead. Presented by Claiborne Farm. The opener, made in special weight. Three-year-olds and up in an even money favorite. One of two Chad Brown runners in the race, Malarchuk, Dylan Davis, getting some opportunities for that barn. He will be aboard. And the featured allowance race later on today, that's in race six. Quick look here at the odds for the opener. Linda Rice with a first-time starter in here, well-schooled. The other Chad Brown, that's sequential to four. This horse has some pedigree. We don't know what we're going to get from these debut runners, but at least you know that there's precocity on the dam side with this one. The dam broke her maiden first time out, ran well as a two-year-old, and is a half to a horse that won his first three starts as well. Meanwhile, that sixth race featured later on this afternoon, three-year-old fillies sprinting six furlongs. It looks like everybody in this race just has the ability to get to the front. Exactly. There are a lot of horses that sort of have questions to answer based on their last races of where they really came from. And Stappin' Buttons is a horse that didn't break all that well, as we're going to take a look at here first time out, and was really well-intentioned on this day, very well bet against this field. And you can see that she just doesn't get out of the gate all that quickly, but then she does end up switching over towards the outside and is able to really circle on by this field. As you can see now, she's at the top of the stretch, already about to go ahead of everyone and just barely being asked for anything at all. So to completely overwhelm this field, she has to do it against winners now. 
and you have to wonder if she was one of those horses that perhaps was a little bit cranked up to go first time out and maybe won't run back exactly the same race. Maybe she might have to do a little bit better to be competitive with others in here. And we'll see who steps forward. This was a pretty impressive debut and it was expected too, even overcoming that, that bad beginning. She went off as a pretty heavy favorite for Rob Atras. So Manny Franco, the return call, five to two morning line. Snap and buttons 402 Eastern start time for that featured race coming up uh, later today. You can play all the action. You know the drill. Get signed up, started with Naira Bets. Go to NairaBets.com. We're going to take a timeout. We'll get a look at this field for the opening race coming up. We're fast on the main track, just 15 minutes away from this opening race on the card. There it is, that $200 deposit match sign-up bonus. Pretty hot start for a man who's a four-time Eclipse Award winner to this meet. Three wins, four seconds already through his first 14 starters. Uh, this Aqueduct Spring meet. He's got two big chances here in the opener coming up. Back with you on America's Day at the Races on our FS2 coverage, brought to you in part where you can play it all, Naira Bets. Go to NairaBets.com at any track, anywhere, anytime. 12 minutes away, opener on this Thursday card from here in South Ozone Park, New York. Maiden special weight, one turn mile. Three-year-olds and up and two Chad Brown runners. We talked about sequential, the four. Malarchuk, the six. Even money on Malarchuk, named after uh, that goaltender, Clint Malarchuk, who survived that life-threatening injury during 1989 NHL game. Got sliced in the neck by a, a skate and didn't think he was gonna live. On the way to the hospital, found out he's gonna be okay, said, can we still make it back for the third period? <laughs> That's how you know you're Hockey dealing with a true athlete, right? Hockey players are the in the world. He was actually back 10 days later Incredible. after 300 stitches as well. Dylan Davis uh, is going to be aboard. Horse going to make his three-year-old debut coming up. Speaking of Chad Brown, what a role he has been on. A couple of stakes wins over the weekend in the disc staff. This was one maybe, well, both of these we're going to get to probably we did not think was going to happen. Cheetah Beauty off the bench gets her first grade at stakes win. And this was a horse that had run well in the past as a three-year-old, but had never run a particularly fast race. But coming back as a four-year-old, you can tell that she's one that really took that step forward. And this was also a day where you did want to save some ground at some point 
point during the race, which is exactly what Dylan Davis did before angling this horse out for a clear run to go by those other horses that had been in front early. And she ran a career best number of an 88 buyer speed figure in here. She likes Aqueduct, she likes to win here, and perhaps they're going to target some tougher spots down the road with her. Chad Brown was surprised by it. He did not even <laughs> think that, that she would put in this kind of performance. He gave a lot of credit to his assistant, Dan Stupp, said, uh, you know, did a great job working with her in the morning, said how well um, this horse was working. And now it's on to bigger and better things. It seems like potentially the ruffian May 4th, gonna keep this uh, filly around one turn races, it seems, and reasoned analysis. Uh, this was actually the one that Chad gave all the credit to Dan Stubb for. Big performance here. This horse had been training really strong in the mornings. And this one, oh wow, 83 buyer, career best effort, beating Maximus Meridius, who looked like early in the stretch, this horse might have been gone. What do you think the ROI is on the other Chad in graded stakes races, right? I mean, this horse is the one that was the less fancied of the two in the wagering. And this horse never had the opportunity to save ground at any point during this race and still ran extremely well to roll right on by a horse that, as you mentioned, looked pretty clear and comfortable heading into the deep stretch. And so big step forward for this one, ran very well in here. And I liked this horse going a little bit less far, getting a little bit less distance to work with, but a big upset for this one. You don't yeah. usually get that price on these connections. Your point to, to Chad Brown, Diana, last two years, I think it's the fourth of his four choices who've won that race. The other, The other, last other. couple of years. <laughs> the other, 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 other. Um, yeah, it's, it's never count out any of his runners, so big effort there, and Eric Cancel getting a big opportunity there on reasoned analysis as we get back to today's action. So here's now the 4-5 to five favorite, and Dylan Davis uh, will ride here. Malarchuk, who was beat a neck last time out. That was going a mile and an eighth back in December, so the three-year-old debut will cut back in distance to a mile. Let's check in. Head downstairs for the first time on the program with Acacia Clement. Hey, Greg, and we'll take a look at both of Chad Brown's runners in here, starting with the one who does have the experience in Malarchuk, and I'm glad you told the story behind the name as well. This cult is not an Ontario bred. The dam is an all of the female family back through the generations of that good Samson pedigrees um, that have had so much success north of the border uh, and just a storied um, operation as well. So this cult who was purchased last year as a two-year-old is 535000 has a couple of starts to second place finishes and last time out showed much improved speed and I'd written down in my notes from his debut in September that he was kind of against the track on debut as well that you really wanted to be forwardly placed and last time out while going the mile in an eighth not the quickest out of the gate but Dylan Davis was decisive in moving this horse forward to get him forward position We've seen Dylan riding very aggressively very decisively which I love to see and this is a horse that I do think will like the mile of a bit better cutting back a touch but um, incredibly fit in here he's a very tall leggy uh, type of frame to him as well but not one of those bigger robust type of physicals I like this horse in this spot I think he uh, certainly finds himself in a good place and we'll see if that experience really can give him the edge in here stable mate though is the number four sequential a yearling purchased by Nyquist out of Beautician who was um, a stakes winner she was second in the Breeders Cup Juvenile Philly second in the spinaway she was very precocious and she's the sister to a couple of good graded stakes winners as well in red ruby who took the black eyed susan among others and motom the lecompte winner and this cult uh, has been held by two handlers here in the paddock, whereas the stablemate only has one. But he, he hasn't done anything naughty as of yet, but you can tell he's kind of looking around. So I'll definitely keep my eyes on him. Very, very well muscled, very strong, very developed for his debut. And for a horse that has a pretty precocious pedigree as well, while he is kicking things off in his three-year-old season, it would indicate that there is some ability to win early, and he looks ready for the races, Greg. So this, the other Chad Brown in this race, is <laughs> seven to two on the first time starter. And then you have a horse that, you know, we just talked about reasoned analysis for Chad Brown. Quando in between the four and the six, this five horse, the only time he was on a fast track, he was only beat a half length 
to the eventual Bayshore winner. And he's a horse that's run well in each start, and you can argue that he was a little bit against the racetrack last time, going that mile over a wet track, as you mentioned. But taking a look at his race where he ends up finishing second to reasoned analysis, I mean, he did not get the smoothest of trips in here, having to wait for that clear running room, angle off the rail, and you can really see a visual acceleration from him as he gets out in the clear and starts to get his momentum going forwards to try to run down a horse that, as you just said, came back and shocked to win the Bayshore. Now, he did have another performance out of this, but it was not a fast track. It was muddy sealed again and went backwards a little bit. Do you hold that as a negative or do you say we want to see what he can do again on a fast track? When you look at who he was facing in that race as well and, and how he was placed early on in that race, the winner of that race was Society Man. Well, we saw him come back and finish second in the wood at a huge price, 106 to 1. So this was a horse that was forwardly placed in there. The pace started coming apart, and he was towards the inside on a day where that may not have been the best place to be. I don't hold it against him too much. There's the even money favorite, though. Malarchuk, Nyquist three-year-old, his debut in his three-year-old campaign here coming up. Well, third time, be the charm. We kick off the post parade here, party with Smarty. 20-year anniversary, Smarty Jones. Could it be? 20 to 1? He'll need a little bit more luck than that to get the job done. Anymore. Perhaps. Here's Bolt to Plata, Trevor McCarthy at 6-1. to one. He's held his own at this level, but he's got some quirks, and this seems like a tougher group. Well-schooled Linda Rice, first-time starter. I like the solid progression in his workout. It's a bullet gate drill for the last one as well. Could have some speed. Here's one of the two for Chad Brown, sequential, the debuter. Has that pedigree, like we mentioned, to be good early on in his career. We just showed you Quando's dirt effort on that fast track, just missing against reasoned analysis, who came back to win the Bay Shore. He's kept good company. You've seen those horses go on and do good things in a variety of stakes races. And Malarchuk, even money, did get down to four to five at one point for Chad Brown. And I think the difference with him and Quando is that he's finished ahead of some of the horses that were able to beat Quando, like Society Man, like Reasoned Analysis as well. And I like the nice outside post for him as he cuts back slightly in distance. Here he is getting a nice warm up under Dylan Davis. So let's look at the second start of his career. December 8th, stretched out to a mile and an eighth when he battled, even when Speedrunner came to him, he fought to the end. He did, and he was with the flow of the race in here. He was forward a day where you wanted to be forward. He saved a lot of ground, but maybe you could argue the mile and an eighth just a little bit farther than he was ready to go. And when you look at the horses that were running behind him, Society Man, uh, even a horse in Eliminate who would come back and run well in the, in the Bayshore finishing third after not doing so well in the Gotham, you have to know that there were at least some decent horses behind him, and he was fighting for that victory, even though he just got beat by Speedrunner. So back down to four to five now for the three-year-old debut coming up. As you look at, you know, the pick five pool ahead, did you see any standouts where you can try and narrow things down? Well, I think everyone's going to go, and not everyone, but anyone who's looking at this favorite in the same light that I am is going to go pretty skinny within this first leg. I think that in the next race, you can maybe try to get a little bit more creative. I have some interest in Bronx Bomber uh, as one of the prices in there. In the race after that, I mean, you're looking at a very heavy favorite and a very likely winner in Giant's Fire, and that's not a horse that I would try to get around. I think that maybe this fourth race is a little bit more wide open. You can make a case for Clem Labine, a horse that missed the start last time. I think Hatch is a little bit interesting. And then in the fifth race, to close things out for that early sequence, you're dealing with a situation where a lot of these horses have yet to show that much in terms of what they've done on the racetrack. And the logicals make sense, like Compute It, like Within View, dropping back in for a tag. Uh, I gave a little shot to Solo Ride, but he's a complete unknown at this level, really on this surface and in terms of his ability. So could you find a price in some of those legs? Possibly. But overall, I think you're staring at two very likely favorites that will be very short prices that are tough for me to get around. And um, one of those, yeah, coming up here, it seems like four to five. Malarchuk, let's head back down to Acacia. 
And we'll take a look at the other first time starter, Greg, and that's the three well school debuting for Linda Rice. And typically with Linda's horses, you do expect them to need a start or two. And while this one definitely has the frame of a horse that looks like he could have some ability, I do think that he will benefit from a start with a fitness standpoint. He's also going to race in a hood. Um, there's no blinkers on him. It's just covering his ears. Sometimes there's even cotton under that hood as well. It's just to muffle the sound for horses that can get a little bit riled up and just to try and keep them calm. You'll often see trainers like Dave Donk use it on about 90% of his horses in the paddock for saddling and just a few of them race with it. Uh, well schooled has the hood under his bridle so he is going to race with that hood on. But this is a horse that Sarah mentioned coming off of uh, a bullet gate drill for his last workout. Typically I don't love to see that workout pattern because it often means when the the last workout from the gate is that the horses have maybe had a little bit of trouble in the gates in the mornings haven't broken that quickly or maybe just still a little bit green and need one last refresher before they race. Now, of course, I don't know the story and it's not a hard and fast rule, but it is something that uh, does sometimes stick out with me if it's a horse that's had to go back to the gate several times. But this is a, a son of world of trouble who is about first time with his first time starters, about 14% and 17% with dirt sprinters. So he does get some runners. The number five, Quando, you guys talked about the horses that he faced, which definitely flattered by last weekend. And this is a horse who actually had a pretty quiet warm up by Kendrick Carmouche standards. Uh, he really puffed up once they put the tack on as well. A little bit underwhelming when he first came into the paddock, but definitely turned around when they put the tack on him and he knew that it was game time. Should be forwardly placed once again. We'll see what he does with the speed of Malarcha who had a lovely solo warm-up on the outside and I have no problems with your favorite. Just Greg, going to try to take a little shot against him with a first-time starter. We'll see. Uh, yeah, Malarchuk obviously was forward last time out. That was going a mile and an eighth. We don't know what we're going to get in terms of pace from these first-time starters. So we'll see how that plays out with the three and the four. And Quando's not exactly slow either. He's a horse that's shown that he can have some forward position going a little bit further as well, like he was last time. It didn't really work out, so they might not try those tactics again. But there could be some speed in this race, and I don't think that Malarchuk's going to be your early leader unless they're really on an all-out send mission or they think that he is just the best horse in this race. He's gotten better than those last two races, and they want to try to take it all the way. I don't think that he will be in front early. Did you walk the track this morning, get a feel for how it might be playing? Yes. No, I did not. Do oh, you I ever you did that most mornings? Do you? <laughs> I have never Actually, done that. Actually, we all go out as a group together. <laughs> that we would walk be the good. Turf. <laughs> I need some rain boots to do that. Here's the two stepping in Bolta Plata for John Terranova. A couple of in the hitting the board finishes against Maiden Special Way. We didn't talk much about that one. Nine to one, nearly double digit odds. He lugs in so badly though in deep stretch. Sequential for Chad Brown and back down. Wow, three to five, shortest price. Malarchuk has been on the board as they step in here. Dylan Davis, last to load, and there he is. We'll see if third time's the charm. Let's go upstairs. Chris Griffin, the call, the opener on this Thursday card from Aqueduct. Decent break towards the outside from Quando and also Malarchuk there, the front two early. Then in between horses is well schooled. Taken back off the pace is going to be sequential. And at the rail, here comes Party with Smarty. They're chasing Malarchuk as they get set to come out of the chute and just happened to check. Just steadied there, was well schooled. Jose Lescano maybe took an awkward step there, is now the trailer. They hook up with the backstretch. Malarchuk has got the lead, is up by a half length. There's Quando right to the outside here in the purple silk stalking from second at the rail. Party with Smarty progressing and steering clear of all the trouble there was sequential. Quenchel is now about to challenge and take third. It's a quick five. Lengths back to Bolta Plata and at the back. Well schooled is the trailer. 23 and one for the opening quarter mile and on the front end at three to five. Malarchuk is now showing the way. It's Malarchuk who's up by a full length. Quando continues to chase here from second. Sequentials had a nice journey here. Three wide is now chasing this leader. At the rail, it's party with Smarty. They got to pick it up from the back. It's Bolta Plata and far, far back. Well schooled 
is the trailer. 46 and 1 that half mile time, and they pick it up up front as Malarchuk is trying to sprint away. Quando is under a full drive towards the outside. Party with Smarty is not cutting into the margin. Same can be said for Sequential. Bolt de Plata and Trevor McCarthy, they're making a move at six lengths off the leader. Malarchuk is still going strong here at the top of the stretch. Malarchuk is now four lengths in front and striding away. It's Malarchuk approaching that final furlong is now five lengths in front. Quando is a clear second. Bolt de Plata, the only one making up ground from the back, but inside the final 16th. No doubt about the winner, Dylan Davis and Malarchuk. They'll win the opener at three to five. Quando for second. Both the Plata will grab third in that photo with Party with Smarty in one minute 35 and one. Malarchuk does not disappoint. That's the way you're supposed to win when you're odds on, maybe not even by that much. And this was a dominant performance. It was, and I think maybe Dylan Davis even looked towards the inside like I did and, and thought, is anybody else going to try to establish some forward position? And then when they tried to do so, it was already too late. Malarczyk was just faster than them and had already crossed over and was in the clear. Tapping on the brakes and steadying back was well-schooled. But, I mean, this horse was just so much the best in this race compared to everybody else. On to bigger and better things. Malarczyk, 135 and 1. That's pretty sharp final time, too, for the mile. Dylan Davis riding for Chad Brown. And the maiden breaker, as easy as can be here in the three-year-old debut. Some issues, particularly with the first-time starter in here, well-schooled on the backstretch. Yeah, it seemed as though the horses didn't get out of the gate all that quickly when they tried to establish that forward position. Oof. There was just no spot for him to go in, and Jose Lascano really had to take up to avoid any sort of incident happening and to keep his horse upright and angle him out in the clear. So just going for a spot that was no longer really available. Bump, horse lost that footing there, as you saw. Scary situation, but uh, able to maintain and another day for well-schooled. Six, five, two, one, three to five favorite. Easy as can be in the opener and a strong start to this meet for Chad Brown continues. Taking the first here at Aqueduct. We'll have the prices when we come back and we'll have the story of these brothers when we return, it's been a family affair for the Cantor Machis. Despite a relatively small stable, they continue to impress on the toughest circuit in the game. Stick around, we'll have their story next. Spun to run. His brilliant speed figures were among the fastest of any three-year-old at a mile or more. Eddie Hales from the legendary Danzig Sire Line. Now, this multiple graded stakes winner, millionaire, and Breeders' Cup champion is passing his remarkable talent along to his progeny. 95, 5, 200, 200, 200, in the back, Patrick, 200,000, thank you. Spun to run, standing at Gainesway. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Boy standing at Claiborne Farm. America's Day of the Races on our FS2 coverage. And we have an inquiry objection 
here in the opener. Mallor Malarchuk, excuse me, Dylan Davis being aggressive out of the gate, making that quick move to get over and get in front. And here it is. Keep your eyes on that red cap. Did this result in that first time start of that three having to take back at all? I mean, to me, in that viewpoint, it looks as though he is coming over and impeding the path of the number three, the first time starter, well-schooled. But when you look at this viewpoint, it's a little bit more convincing that he had that racetrack available to him, right? That he had that room to come over, that he was well clear while doing so. And it seemed as though both party with Smarty and well-schooled wanted a spot to move forward that was already gone by the time they went for it, at least to me. But they are taking a look at it. They are taking their time with it. That view seem, seems like he would be okay. Well, they are taking a little bit longer look than we would think it was gonna be over and done with quickly. Let's get Acacia's take on it. What'd you see, Acacia? Well, it is, yes, the Mallark truck did come over and, and it looked to me like he was clear to come over to set the pace at that point. But just something to point out with the three well-schooled as he stumbled at that point, well-schooled has no right eye. So on top of that equipment that I talked about with the hood, uh, he also can't see out of the right side. Plenty of horses we've seen over the years have been able to race without having a uh, an eye and are able to get along just fine. Uh, Patch always comes to mind. But it's also possible that maybe Well School didn't really see what was going on to his outside as that was the point when Malarchuk came over. Not exactly sure if that's the case, but just something that I thought was worth pointing out as well, Greg. All right, Acacia, thanks for that. Uh, we will see what happens here. Connections, waiting, something you never want to be part of. You win, especially when you win by this easy of a margin. It seems like it would be difficult to take the, the, this horse down. And, and again, looking at that pan view, did look like he was clear. But we'll wait and see. Yeah, we'll wait and see what they say. I mean, at least to me, it doesn't look like something where they would make a change. But you never know what they're going to do. And I think that, as you've said, Taking a horse down that was just so much the best in this field, it doesn't really do a service to anybody. Not the connections of the horse, not to the betters, not to anybody that just went ahead and singled the three to five in this race because he ran like a three to five shot should. And we'll take another look here. He still looks clear when he comes over. So keep your eyes here on the six, that three moving up into that space, the first time starter. Tough to see that there's anything there. And they've just announced Chris Griffin, our track announcer, there is no change. So a little drama here in the opener. In the end, the big odds on favorite who won by, I don't even know the final margin. A lot. <laughs> a lot and more probably uh, is safe and gets that win of three to five. So Dylan Davis, Chad Brown, picture time here to kick things off on this Thursday card. And I think what Acacia mentioned is so important to note of a horse that maybe if he wasn't really aware of what was happening as much as a horse with two decent viewing eyes would be able to say, maybe he overreacted a little bit as well and kind of caught himself off guard. It was also his first race and he might have just been a little bit more reactive than another horse in a similar type of spot or similar situation. Hard to argue you cost anyone a placing as well. When you win by that much. Um, so Malarchuk with the win, three to five. Next race coming up, this second race, New York Breads, $25,000 claiming race, seven eighths of a mile. And the Cantor Machi Barn will have two chances coming up in this race. And I know you like one of them. We'll get to uh, coming up in a moment. Uh, let's head back down to Acacia. Wow. Oh, yeah. sorry. Terribly. Um, let's talk this second here first. Um, obviously, Prince of Pharaohs. Linda Big Rice, going to take a lot of support in this spot. What's the case against here? I think that you always have to look at horses like this and wonder why they're dropping in for the tag that they are. And this is one that he had horses that were just so much better than him when he was running in the past and just seems to be really off his game as of late. Though, of course, the company that he's kept a lot tougher than he's going to be facing here. Much better. Big drop in class for a barn that has started off uh, as strong as she's been all year, Linda Rice. Ready for vacation now, let's head downstairs. And happy to be joined by Dylan Davis. Uh, Dylan, you had to sweat out that inquiry there. What did you feel at that pivotal point in the race? Uh, well, uh, first off, I just wanted to break well. Uh, he come out running nicely. I had to kind of get his position, uh, riding him out of there. He's kind of a one-pace horse. Happy with the way he was uh, responding with me. Uh, when I made my move to cross over to take control of the lead, I was, I was two lengths clear. Um, 
And then when I cleared, uh, maybe uh, the rider inside, Lescano, maybe had a difficult time uh, with his horse, maybe, you know, settling him back or which gave him a hard time and uh, maybe uh, maybe just run up on my heels a little bit. Uh, but uh, after that, he was. I'm glad that he's okay and everything like that. But, um, you know, then my horse was able to take control and then he responded well down the lane. He really he took advantage of this field and the team did a good job here. You rode Belarchuk last time, too, going a mile and an eighth, and it seemed like that fitness, that experience, just really served him well in the cutback today. Yeah, I think so. Uh, also, uh, uh, he got that uh, conditioning under him. Uh, he was running against stayers and endurance horses in the two turns, so he was. Uh, I think the mile is more of a sprint with the one turn. Uh, he allowed that uh, lead early, and he was very comfortable all the way to the quarter pole. So I just got in running a little bit earlier than, than we would usually, and uh, he responded nicely and, uh, again, just galloped all the way to the wire. Thanks a lot, Dylan. Well done. Thank you. Greg? Keisha, thanks. So Dylan Davis with the win here to kick off this card. He had a three-win day back on a Wood Memorial Saturday, coming off a meet title the Aqueduct winter meet, and you know, we saw him get that first ever group on one of his career just a few years ago for Christophe Clement. Now he's in with the Chad Brown barn, really progressing in his career. Absolutely, and, and when he's more aggressive, he's more effective, and he was saying that Malarchuk's kind of that one pace type of horse, but if that's the pace that you're going to get consistently from any horse, I'd be pretty happy. Good place to be in front of everybody else. The second race, uh, we touched on it briefly. Prince of Arrows, Linda Rice, the big class dropper. Going to get a lot of attention in this spot. That 9-2 to two is going to change. Don't get too excited. Seven furlongs, New York Preds, $25,000 claiming race coming up. And the barn you're about to meet, they're going to have two chances in this race coming up. Their father was a successful trainer in his own right in Turkey, but it was his push for his sons to make the move to the States, dreaming of even big old goals for them, that landed Mackin and Ilkay here in New York. And the move, little by little, has started to pay big dividends as the Cantor Machis have made big inroads here on the Naira circuit. In the future, I'm expecting to, of course, win the stakes races, and which I think it's it's very soon about to come. Uh, I think the biggest change we won the greatest stakes after uh, 22 Saratoga meet with Heavy Jets. There's Heavy Jets who's ready to pounce up on the outside. Which we were talking about, like we we are very close to win the stakes races. Heavy Jets who's two lengths in front. Heavy Jets sprints to the line. It's going to be Heavy Jets and the Noble Damsel. We almost slip at the barn. We are young and we want to do it. We are hungry for success. And we want to show our success to my family, my dad, everybody. So it was very emotional. It was our first stakes in the United States. It was very important for me and Matt. Madkin and Ilkay Kantermasi grew up in Istanbul, Turkey, watching their father, Tumjai, one of the country's top trainers, win big race after big race. He was always telling us, I want you guys in the better spot, better spot. So he made United States his goal for our future. Like, especially Saratoga, when we come to Saratoga, we start coming like five years ago, and you deal with in the racetrack, mostly really professional people. I think the best, one of the best places to be, uh, United States, and especially New York. Another change at the Cantor Masi barn, Matt Ken wants to use the golf cart less, spending more time riding their stable pony, Sierra Sun, leading horses to and from the track during training. The 11-year-old gelding is still a work in progress as he transitions from his days as a racehorse. Sierra's son holds a special place in the hearts of Matt Cannon and Ilkay. He won seven races for the brothers at smaller tracks when they were just getting started in the United States. While their father is in Turkey this summer watching his son's races late at night, Matt Cannon and Ilkay's mother loves to visit during the Saratoga meet. Their passion for the sport and understanding that nothing comes easy, win or lose, keeps their focus on the day-to-day -day grind of running a successful stable. Just advantage first turn because we are number two. It's April Antics, three and a half length lead. trying to get in the second. Whoever, whoever 
put down. Very close. And there's Matt Ken. They'll send out again Bronx Bomber. And Amundsen coming up in this race. And one of the great horses that kind of changed the trajectory of, the, of their family here in the States, Evy Jets. And Robert Amendola and, and the Cantramachis claimed that filly at the time for $80,000, became a six-time winner, multiple graded stakes, one of the Noble Damsel, their first ever graded stakes win. They'd go on to win the Boston Spa this past summer at better than 29 to 1. But Robert Amendola, the late Robert Amendola, big supporter of them here early on and really gave them a shot. Absolutely. And they've really taken full advantage of that and have horses that can really do it all, different levels in terms of where they're successful. They have these claiming horses, but they also have the graded stakes horses on the grass as well. And they're really developing that well-rounded stable for them as they pick up business here in the U.S. Let's uh, set it downstairs for more with Acacia. Good to see them having success, and we'll see if they have some more here coming up in the second race. They have a strong hand with two runners, Greg, but I did get a chance to just catch up with Matt Ken about their stable star, Evie Jets, who is back on the work tab and has been training sharply here in New York. And he said that she's pointing to the Churchill Distaff Turf Mile on Kentucky Derby Day. And we'll get a chance to see her back in New York for some more stakes tries throughout the year, which is definitely a treat because you can just see how much she means to Matt Ken and Ilkai and just the, the emotion that she brings, the success, the notoriety that she's brought to their stable and I think that she's garnered a lot of fans here on the circuit as well because she's such an honest mare that just goes out there does her thing and runs her race every time and uh, for the brothers they've had a lot of success claiming horses as well horses that seem to flourish in their care that are always well turned out prior to the races and a stable that's continuing to grow and it's always fun and exciting to see a new team and uh, not so new for us now as we've gotten to follow them Greg but one that is always doing right by the horse and it's showing on the racetrack as well. Yeah, no question. Great story. I see a former claimer too go on to become a multiple graded stakes winner. And the last time that we saw her, she becomes grade one place. So good to see they're having some aggressive um, trying to spot her in some aggressive spots going forward. It's a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. They obviously think that she has that ability to get back to the kinds of races that she was running last year. And really, the Cantormasis are one of the few people that you can say nobody has anything bad to say about them on the backside in terms of what they do with their horses and what their ability and their kindness as well to others. I have never heard one negative word from anyone about them. 16 minutes to post here in the second. Again, that barn going to send out two runners coming up in this next race. We'll get to the post parade when we come back. We'll have this for you when we return as well. 2023, boundaries were shattered in this sport. Historic achievements by three leading ladies. I'll introduce you to this trio next on America's Day at the Races.
The rise of women in racing has been undeniable. And there may have not been a better year for female trainers than 2023. Jenna Antonucci brought Peter Pan Stakes winner Archangelo into a wide open and competitive Belmont Stakes with the hopes of a big run from the son of Arrogate. What she got was a magical moment in history. Archangelo is fiercely determined. He has jettisoned national treasure. Forte's coming late. Oh, he's got a chance. Forte coming out the outside. Trying to catch Archangelo. He couldn't do it. Archangelo has won. It wasn't the only shining mark for Archangelo and Antonucci. The Colt went on to win the Travers and was named champion three-year-old. Linda Rice has always been a force to be reckoned with on the Naira circuit. Even with multiple grade one wins and meet training titles, Rice accomplished something no one has ever done in New York. Georgia's Vice Active Lane. It's a Linda Rice exacta. It's Linda Rice 165 wins on the New York Racing Association circuit. 165 wins in a single calendar year, a feat no trainer has ever reached until now. Brittany Russell also made history inside New York and in Maryland. In just her fourth full season as a trainer, Russell became the first horsewoman to be crowned leading trainer in a calendar year in Maryland. Her shining accomplishment came with her first grade one victory when Doppelganger upset the Carter Handicap in April. Doppelganger's trying to pull it off. Doppelganger on the grandstand side. Doppelganger, the longest shot in the field, wins the Carter. 2023 was a year to remember for women in racing. The possibilities are endless for what may come next. Just an incredible year, what happened last year in horse racing. To think about all the history in the Triple Crown, no female trainer had ever won one of those three legs. Jen Antonucci breaks through the year Brittany Russell had, the year Linda Rice had, um, inspiring a lot of young women uh, to follow in their footsteps. It's just nice to see that representation and how all of these women have the success that they did last year in breaking those barriers and being successful. And it was Jenna Antonucci who said, if you can't find a seat at the table, make your own table. And she was right because there isn't a lot of representation of women in racing in general. And it's become a lot more involved in terms of how all of these women are having the success that they're having on this circuit, especially, but really all over the country. And it's just nice to see that it is becoming more of that equal playing field. Fun to watch. And hopefully it continues to move forward. Linda Rice has not missed a beat at all after that outstanding year last year. Having a tremendous meet early on here in the Aqueduct Spring. You could be part of the action. Third and final leg of the Triple Crown. Potentially watch history being made. We know there's going to be history I'll be already being made with the Belmont first time ever being held at historic Saratoga. Live coverage will be seen on Fox, but you can be part of the action. Get you a few remaining tickets that are still around for that festival week. This is a look at early on part of that lineup on Thursday and Friday. A lot going on. Do you have your housing set? Working on that. <laughs> But it's it's in process. Um, can't wait. It's gonna be so much fun. That town, we we see it come alive every summer. I think it's gonna come come alive even to a next level, which is hard to imagine. Exactly. And I know that we're all a little bit hesitant to embrace change in general, not just in this sport, but in general. But this is a once in a lifetime or maybe thrice, depending on the construction opportunity, to be able to see these races held up there and experience them in that town as well. It's going to be fun. Hopefully you can be part of the action. If not, we'll bring it to you on the program so you can catch it all on Fox as we get back into our Thursday coverage. And the second race start of the early pick four. Seven furlongs, New York breads, and this $25,000 claiming race all for sale for that price. And the Cantermachi runners, the two Bronx Bombers, six to one. Amundsen outside, five to one, the favorite right now. Big engine for Wayne Potts. Let's head back downstairs to Acacia. Yeah, a little bit of an interesting board at the moment, Greg. And since we were talking about the Cantermassies, we'll take a look at one of their runners with Amundsen, one of the two that I'll discuss, both of which are reclaims in here. And Cantermassies dip back in for Amundsen, who does have some back class as well. Now, this is a horse who finished fifth last time out for 32, drops in for the 25 today, which is the level at which they claimed him. And as I touched on earlier, I've often found that with this 
with this barn, the horses tend to improve the longer that they're in uh, the Cantramasi's care. So second off the claim, I'm intrigued by this horse to see if he can turn things around. I thought that he ran quite well two starts back behind Market Alert, who was, uh, who's also in this race and will rematch. He also going out for a new barn. And like I said, the fact that they dip back in to claim this horse. And I'm wondering if he can get some of his speed back. He's pretty laid back here in the paddock, so I'm going to be watching how he warms up on the track. But as I said before, Dylan Davis has been riding aggressively and we'll see if some of that early foot that this horse used to show will make an appearance this afternoon. As is always the case with the barn, he looks terrific from a health and fitness perspective. The four Prince of Pharaohs was nine to five on the morning line and is pretty cold on the board uh, as far as this big drop is considered. And that gives me a little bit of cause for pause, particularly because this is also a reclaim. Linda Rice was the original trainer of Prince of Pharaohs, had him for quite a while and he ran against some really, really tough races. And now he's dropping all the way down in for the 25,000 after finishing a distant third last time out. He's always a horse that carries a lot of weight and conditioning. Uh, so he does get on a, a fast track today after running on good and sloppy in his last two races. That I think he will appreciate. Um, his record on a wet track certainly shows that and his physical backs it up. His coat looks great. Again, his weight is typical of what it usually is he's very quiet here in the paddock and um, that's not abnormal for him either but with this drop in class and again given the fact that he has the ability to be uh, up into the race a little bit more I'm going to keep an eye on how he warms up to see if he can perk up in the preliminaries and hopefully get back on track for the first time in a while Greg. All right, Acacia, thank you. We'll keep an eye on that. Is Kendrick Carmouche about to get a leg up on Prince of Pharaohs? Actually, the, the one we expect Market Alert probably to be second choice in here, but the one and the four, are the same price in the doubles. So it's probably going to be those two vying for favoritism when the gates open. A little bit of cause for pause on the big drop down with where the money's gone at least early on in this race. When you see something like this, would you be a little bit more hesitant? Uh, wait close. I mean, if, if it's still this price as they're about to load into the gate, then yeah, big time. But you'd give it that time to sort of even yeah. out and be a little bit more like you thought it would be. That's I fair. Do. Yeah. I, I think that he makes a lot of sense in here, but I wasn't his biggest fan with how he's been running lately. I know he's been facing better horses in general, but I also kind of wonder how forward is he really going to be cutting back slightly from the mile distance when he's been that stalking type going a little bit further as well. Coming onto the track, we hear the call to post there in the background. We're going to see market alert first here in a moment. Coming off back-to-back -back wins. And this used to be a canter machi horse, just claimed off of that barn, now with Rob Falcone. He's in great form. He's won his last two races, trying to get that third consecutive win and going to another capable outfit. He beat Amundsen, and he beat this horse as well in the most recent start, Bronx Bomber. I like this horse a little bit. I like Manny Franco getting back aboard, and I wonder if he's going to be aggressively handled today. Yeah, it looks like potentially... Could be in front in this spot. Big engine, Trevor McCarthy for Wayne Potts. He's getting a little bit of class relief relative to his last two races. I don't know that we're ever going to see the 91 buyer horse again, but we'll see. Here's the patented big warm-up from Kendrick Carmouche, <laughs> Prince of Pharaohs for Linda Rice. And you can expect him to be in a sort of stalking position as he does take that class drop. Boston shout, Wayne Potts second off the claim. His last couple of races haven't been bad, finishing second to Victorious Wave, but maybe needs a little bit of a step forward in this field. Got a bunch of veterans in this race, and another one here with major back class. Amundsen, eight-year-old, who's an 11-time winner. I just wonder if his better races are far back in the rearview mirror, a horse that over his last couple has not really put it together, but he's faced some good fields, and as you said, he has those races to return to in the past. The horse was actually very competitive, Back in November, just four starts ago for 50000 Had to deal with Radio Red, three starts back, who would be odds on in this field. Here's Market Alert. So Rob Falcone claims this one off of the Cantor Machis.
Again, trying to win three in a row, and he beat Amundsen, as mentioned, in this race back on March 8th. And I know that he had to wait for that clear running room, but the split opens up so well for this horse to be able to secure that real estate and go and punch on through while Amundsen had to go a little bit wider, but he did get started ahead of him and not highlighted, but going widest of all is Bronx Bomber, who was actually in last early in this race. And I think that with a cleaner trip and a little bit more forward position, he could be more effective in this spot. But Market Alert, even though he got the great trip, he still ran very well to go through that spot. And at lower levels like this, you don't always see the braveness of some of these horses to be willing to take those chances and go in those tighter spots. And this is in this field, he's the young man in here, six year old <laughs> market alert, the one five to two right now as we look at big engine, 14 time winner, nine year old is one over 680,000 in his career. We go back to March 3rd. This was two starts back and a win for a starter allowance. And he's one of those horses that really does seem to do better when he can make that inside move and run up the rail. But this was the day where he got some significant pace to close into. Those two horses were dueling on the front end and he was able to scoop them both up. And with him, I just wonder if he's going to get the same kind of pace scenario coming up in this race. It doesn't seem as though there are that many horses that want that forward position to help set up for him. Let's see how it plays out. Bronx Bomber, we think, wants to go market alert from that inside post, probably has to go as well. I think so, but when you're dealing with Eric Cancel and a horse that hasn't shown as much speed, I'm a little bit more confident that he's not going to be on an all-out send mission. Let's go back to Acacia. Yeah, I would certainly agree with Sarah in that respect. And if you watch Market Alert's last race, he had the rail that time as well. And he didn't break that sharply and then kind of moved up to get into contention. And it was a great ground saving trip that day with being able to stay on the rail. And this is a horse that can be a bit quirky, but he's really come a long way in the last couple of years. Used to be he would freeze leaving the bell in the Belmont Tunnel or coming out from the paddock or he would just be really tough to handle prior to the races. It, he, he looked asleep back in the paddock today, actually. He did perk up on track a lot. He has gotten a bit hot, um, but for horses that have been based here in New York, it's much warmer today. I mean, I just flew in from Florida this morning and I'm, I'm, I'm actually feeling a little bit warm out here. And if anybody knows me and how I handle temperature, you know that it's definitely warming up. But Market Alert is in great form right now and we'll see if he can keep that momentum going. The number two Bronx Bomber, I wanted to reserve judgment for him based on how he warmed up out on the track and as Sarah said was last last time as he did not break well at all and spotted the field several lengths early on and had to go wide and just didn't really have quite enough punch to get any better than third but Manny Franco rode him two back when he was much more forwardly placed and actually setting the pace Manny did not even link with the pony for a post parade he took him right off and gave him a strong warm up he moved beautifully out there on the track I, I really like like what I saw from him and I'm hoping that he can run more of a race that, of what we saw from him two starts back and uh, just as far as Prince of Pharaoh's warm-up yes he had a strong warm-up under Kendrick Carmouche took him a little while to get going though um, so just as far as what I'm seeing from warm-ups uh, the best one would go to Bronx Bomber Greg well 11 to 1 on the horse who wins the beauty pageant here you can sort of see in the background there, blocked by the pony, Manny Franco for the Cantermachis. Well, we'll if see Acacia, if this horse can't control. If Acacia's on board, I guess I have to bet more, right? 11 to 1. <laughs> Going to love that price if you're right. Especially if you're keen to, to start off a pick four. Take a look at what's in that pool right now. We'll see if this horse can get loose. And I think that really the ride that he got last time, it's nobody's fault, but that's just not really where he wants to be early on in the race. And I think my main reservation with him is if he will be able to get the seven for a long distance well enough as he's primarily been at six or even a little bit shorter than that. But if he's alone up front and comfortable, I think that there's a better opportunity for him to do just that. Well, this horse Sat just off the pace last time out. Now at the inside post, we'll see what Eric Cancel chooses to do. Was, as mentioned, in the Cantermachi barn. Now trying to beat that barn for Rob Falcone and trying to win three in a row coming up. Favoritism has gone to the four as we expected. Took a little while, but Prince of Pharaohs now the two to one top choice. The four who will load shortly. Seven year old taking the big drop down in class for Linda Rice. 32% start early on 
to this meet already with seven winners. It's pretty incredible. We expect no less. Setting the bar too high for herself. <laughs> Prince of Pharaohs will load next. And we're set for the early pick four on this Thursday card here on our FS2 coverage. Let's go to Chris Griffin. Bustin shouts in, Amundsen to the outside. And it, all set. And they're off. Pretty decent beginning. Slight stumble down towards the inside for market alert. Maybe a bobble there as they come out of the chute. There's Prince of Pharaohs in front. Prince of Pharaohs right to the lead. Bronx Bomber to apply the pressure towards the inside. Pink cap. That's Amundsen. Three across the racetrack. Bustin Shout has taken off the early kick. Yellow Blinkers is now a past fourth. Is now moving into that position. It's going to be market alert. And the trailer is Big Engine. They work up the back stretch at 12 to 1. Bronx Bomber has got the lead. Bronx Bomber and Manny Franco and Neck in front. They went 22 and 4 for that opening quarter mile. Still three across the racetrack. In between horses there is Prince of Pharaohs. Two wide, three wide is going to be Amundsen, Dylan Davis looking for the early double. At the rail there is Market Alert. Going to need some room towards the inside of Ground Saving Journey. Then under drive it's Bust and Shout from fifth and the trailer is Big Engine. Well into the far turn, they're still chasing Bronx Bomber. Bronx Bomber still at 12 to 1 is up by 2 and Bronx Bomber doing it nicely enough as they approach a quarter mile left to go. 45 and 3 for the half mile time. Now Amundsen is fully in gear. Pink cap towards the outside and Amundsen means business and Amundsen is now challenging Bronx Bomber. They're a clear 1-2 as they approach a final furlong. Market Alert is trying to catch them both at the rail but Amundsen is kicking away. It's Amundsen now passing down towards the inside. It's Market Alert. The only one within range as they approach the 16th pole. Amundsen trying to hold off the oncoming charge of Market Alert. Gonna be tight here at the finish. Amundsen will hold on. Amundsen over Market Alert. Bronx Bomber and Bust and Shout in one minute 22 and three. Our feature angle paying dividends again. Cantor Machi Barn, Amundsen with the victory second off the claim. 12th career win for this eight year old. And it's the other Cantor Machi to me, even though this one was a little bit more uh, live on the tote board. It's had a nice stalking trip towards the outside. And Prince of Pharaohs, he established some forward position because Bronx Bomber did not get out of the gate all that quickly and then ended up slowly moving into contention. Just could not see things out. Market alert making a good run like he has been as of late. But, I mean, you have to be at least a little bit disappointed with some of the shorter priced favorites in this race, like Prince of Pharaohs, as well as Big Engine. 6125, the big class dropper. This is rare for Linda Rice not hitting the board, who was handled fairly aggressive early, tried to get that position uh, early on in this race, and eventually Brox Bomber took command in front, but nowhere late. No, and it's not as though the pace completely dissolved. I mean, Bronx Bomber started to fade in the very late stages of this race, but it's not as though he backed out of there completely or these, they set these wicked, impossible fractions to be able to be a part of. Busy goings-ons in this race as well. The one, three, and four, we're told, all claimed out of this race. So Prince of Pharaohs, big engine, market alert. All going to be moving to new barns after this one. But it's Amundsen with the win. Five to one. Dylan Davis, the early double. Chad Brown in the opener. Cantor Machi Barn here in the second. While well, the prices, when we come back, hot start to the meet for that young man right there. When we return, despite a runner-up finish in Saudi Arabia, Skelly's seven-race win streak still intact, at least on U.S. soil. See if he can keep it going. In the count fleet, Coming up this weekend, we'll have a preview ahead. Country Pick 5 combines the best racing from New York with top races from around the country in one bet. Find it in your track venue and play every race day. Races are posted weekly at naira.com slash cross country. 
RaceLens is the most in-depth product in horse racing with unique features found nowhere else. True odds, predictive analysis, and pace projection. RaceLens, it will change the way you follow horse racing and take your game to the next level. Wicked Halo, who wins the Raven Run Stakes. Nobody catching society. Red Fruit One Cyberknife has won the Haskell over Tama and Kanai the Forgo. Sierra Leone wins the Toyota Bluegrass. Two million three hundred thousand. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira Circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state-bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info. Back in our Fox Sports 2 coverage for the Thursday card here at Aqueduct. Thanks for being with us. America's Day at the Race is brought to you in part by Hillendale at Alapa. It's the early double for that young man right there, Dylan Davis, coming off a meet title, Aqueduct winter meet. And starting off strong here in the spring meet. Teams up here with a canter, Machi Barn on Amundsen. Let's go downstairs to Acacia. And I'm very happy to have Matt Can here with us as Amundsen gets the win. And Matt, a nice uh, turnaround for this horse that you actually reclaimed. And we've seen you had have success with that. What was it about this horse to go back in for? So when we claimed earlier in Saratoga, he ran really good race uh, that day. And we wait, we see the improvement on him. We try uh, stakes race, actually. And after that, we went back to the claiming race. So after that, we lost him, and then we got back together. Uh, we got lucky. I know him a little bit, and I know what he wants. He, as some horses get older, they need some little different things. And we see that, and I explained to Dylan, and he did everything correct. So it had. And we've seen the patience from you and Ilkai and your entire team. When you claim a horse, it seems like they get better the, the longer they're with your barn as you start to get to know them better. As long as they, they show us they are healthy and sound and they are doing what we want from them in the mornings, it's, it makes much easier in time for me to bring them afternoon in a better, better form. It's been a good start to the meet for your barn as well. And as I asked you before the race, your stable star, Evie Jets, back on the work tab and pointing to the uh, Churchill Distaff Turf Mile. What have you seen from her and how is she doing coming back this year? She's doing good. We actually brought her earlier than last year, what we did with her. Uh, but the, you know, weather and the time, uh, she, she gained weight a little bit. And last year we stopped a little earlier with her because we didn't know if we will keep going or we will just... Uh, retire her and s go through the sale. So we decided to bring her back and we just want to make it 100% right for her so we don't want to take chance 99%. I think she, she will be ready first week of May, Derby Day. She will take us to Churchill. Well, we can't wait to see her. So fun that she's back for another year and congratulations on the win here. Thank you so much. All right, Greg, you heard it there. Not 99%. Evie Jets will be 100% fit and it'll be fun to see her back this year. Yeah, it'll be great to see. We, we talked a lot about Evie Jets before we had that story, and she was a great story for this barn. Um, for everyone who is familiar with her story on this circuit, former claimer, now multiple graded stakes winner, grade one placed as well. So it'll be fun to see her come back. Amundsen, the only work for the Cantor Machis today. This is it. And they get a uh, first and third place finish. Uh, in the only race they're represented in, so pretty pretty productive Thursday afternoon. I guess so, and one of their former runners ended up finishing second in this race as well, so maybe you could try to stretch it and say that they had the trifecta. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could try. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up this weekend, not just our ABR race of the week in the grade one Apple Blossom out in Hot Springs, also pretty competitive group of sprinters lining up the grade three count fleet sprint handicap. Half a million dollar purse. Something tells me Steve Asmussen is going to have a pretty big say uh, in this race. He's going to line up three of them, including Skelly, who before he went to Saudi Arabia had won seven straight. This was his seventh in a row. He is just so quick out of the gate. 
He is, and he's been able to run numbers that are just consistently quite a bit a step above what a lot of the other horses in this field have been able to do in the past. And he has the speed advantage on a horse like Tejano Twist as well, who is very consistent in his own right. And I mean, this is a division that now this year with a lot of the top contenders going to the bench is really just hungry for somebody to be that star. And I think what he did finishing second over in Saudi Arabia shows that he does have this ability to really be competitive on a worldly basis with the speed that he has. Strange not to see him in front at really any point in the race. And I guess maybe that shows you that they could be a little bit more tactical with him. They could try something different if they really wanted to, but I'm sure going into this race coming up, they know that he's good on the front end. They know that he has the speed to be there, and I doubt that they are gonna take it away from him. Uh, there's two stable mates who are going to line up against him in this race. They're not slow either. I don't know if they're as quick as him, but they're probably going to be breathing right down his neck. Here's a look at what Steve Asmussen has done in the Count Fleet. Pretty incredible group of names, especially recently. Jackie's Warrior, Matoli, eventual champion. Two of them. Jackie's Warrior, I think, is going to wind up in the Hall of Fame very soon. Good group. Absolutely. And when you look at who's in this race this year, we don't have a Matoli. We don't have a Jackie's Warrior. We don't have that star male sprinter. And Skelly's probably going to be that horse that fills that role going forwards. See how step by step, we'll see what he does coming back from Saudi Arabia, but he was unbeatable basically uh, until that performance where it looked like he was going to make it eight in a row and he just got caught late in that spot. That's coming up part of our Saturday coverage from Hot Springs. So I hope you tune in to our Fox coverage this Saturday afternoon. Whitmore Stakes. This was a bit of a surprise because we thought it was going to be Rivet's day. He went off the favorite in the air, and his stablemate upended him, Jackson Traveler. Yeah, this was uh, the other Steve Asmussen, right? I mean, Rivet really went all in on the front end and set some pretty blistering fractions. And Jackson Traveler got that nice outside trip. It's not as though he's never been capable of running a fast race, even though he hasn't hit the triple digit buyers. And he came up with one of his better performances in this spot to get his nose down on what was a tight photo over Tejano Twist. Now you, you brought up Tano Twist. He's going to need a little bit of a setup if he's going to be effective, but he is very good. He's very consistent. Can he get that, or is Skelly just loosen here? It depends, because when you have a trainer that's sending out three horses from the same barn that might all have early speed, I doubt that they're going to all cancel each other out. And I think that Skelly is naturally the fastest of those three. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out tactically. I doubt that Steve Aspen wants all of his horses burning each other out to set it up for a horse like Tiana Twist. Coming up as part of our Saturday coverage, that is race eight on the Saturday card from Hot Springs on Apple Blossom Day. Catch it live on our Fox Sports coverage. We're gonna take a timeout 23 days away. From the run for the roses, we know that one right there is going to be your favorite. The two-year-old champ, fierceness, back and better than ever, it appears, after that Florida Derby final prep. And a likely second choice could not have a more different running style. Sierra Leone, we'll have a preview coming up.
Dreaming in front. Always Dreaming with Battle of Midway a length and a half behind as they come into the final furlong. Looking at Lee is making a bid now through on the inside up into second. Always Dreaming with a two and a half length lead of 16th to go. Looking at Lee is second. Then comes Battle of Midway, Classic Empire. They're coming to the line and the dream comes true. Always Dreaming has won the Kentucky Derby. Always dreaming on that wet track in the 2017 Kentucky Derby winning for Todd Pletcher. Jubilant there getting his second Kentucky Derby win for two guys that grew up as children together playing stickball and dice in Williamsburg, Vinny Viola and Anthony Bonomo. And when you have a rider like John Velasquez on a horse with some sort of natural early speed to take you into that race, you are of a dangerous combination. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at with him in furiousness because it's a similar route, right? Always dreaming, winner of the Florida Derby, going on to win the Kentucky Derby. And now you have fierceness attempting to do the same off that Florida Derby win. Much more brilliant though, what we've seen with fierceness, his performance at the Breeders' Cup. Do you have an you take a look at what Pletcher's done since that always dreaming Derby win? Best finish was Audible in third. That's the only horse to hit the board since that time. Um, just incredible. I mean, he was the talk of that weekend, fierceness, uh, Breeders' Cup weekend with what he did. And then after a flop as a three-year-old, he comes back and shows even better. He has just better ability in him than anyone in this three-year-old crop right now, but we'll see if he can deliver on Derby Day because when he has been faced with some adversity, he's not been able to overcome it. No, he hasn't. And, and seeing this performance from him, seeing the real fierceness show up in this Florida Derby with John Velasquez just taking him to the front early on and opening up in the later stages of this race, you're looking at a brilliant performance that obviously is going to make him a major player in the Kentucky Derby. But what we've seen from him on days where things don't go his way, where there are minor inconveniences in terms of not getting out of the gate as quickly or a wet track, he doesn't have that same kind of special blowout performance available. And when you are dealing with a 20 horse field, it's very rare that you get the kind of nice setup and trip that he got in this Florida Derby. And at a short price, I'm willing to kind of take the chance that maybe things don't all go his way. If they do though, he'll be extremely dangerous. See what other, yeah, who's gonna try and tackle him early too in this race, because you don't want him to get out there loose all by himself, it could be, looking at him a long way in front of you for that mile and a quarter, maybe all the way to the wire. So it's going to be fascinating to see who attempts to put pressure on him early on. We know it's not going to be the likely second choice. That is not the way Sierra Leone wants to run. He's going to come from far out of it. He'd love to see some horses duel with fierceness up front. He's been so impressive in the way that he's been able to make up ground in so many of his races, and this was no exception. I mean, Keeneland is a track that's historically difficult to make these long, sustained closing bids on, and he did so, so easily, able to run down the center of the racetrack, and you can see him just lower his head and really get into stride in his races, and he's sort of run each of his races the same way, where he makes that big, bold move around the turn to get himself into position and this was a big win for him over just a touch who's a fairly good horse in his very small career so far it's always just a question of whether or not this is the running style that you want to take heading in the Kentucky Derby and so then you have two situations where you have horses with a lot of talent but are they going to get the right kind of setup at short prices on that day and too look even if fierceness gets out in front and is able to do his thing Distance becomes a question. It's mile and a quarter. It's a, it's a question for everyone. Likely the only time for most of these horses that are ever going to do it in his career. We'll see who shows up and is their best dealing with that distance, with that crowd. Yeah, talking about too, like how the track, what weather we're going to, you know, get on that day as well. Where they're all going to line up in terms of the starting gate, and it's a much more fairer starting gate, at least for the inside, really inside and outside, than it used to be. That inside post used to be just absolutely brutal uh, before they got that new starting gate. Yeah, not having that auxiliary and being able to really even out the playing field so that you're not faced with having a decision where you either check, take back or have to really gun to not be right on the rail. It's a much fairer place to be towards the inside. And even we've seen horses be successful from the far outside. Rich Strike being one of them. Tail of the tape. They've accomplished a lot already. 
We'll see what happens on Derby Day. Now all these, it, this has got to be the most nerve-wracking time for everyone who has a horse who's expected to line up in that, that field of 20. Getting your horse just to stay sound, everything go okay, stay on target to that, you know, till the gates open on that first Saturday in May. You want to wrap them in bubble wrap, right? Make yeah. sure that they are staying in training to the best of their ability and that nothing, no minor setbacks come up and that everything goes according to plan to just get them into that gate with the horse that you think that you have going forwards. And we're pretty much set on who's going to be in that race, but there's still one more possibility in terms of the Lexington and who could be coming up to get some points to get himself in there, and that's Hades. But this is the leaderboard so far, and this is the majority of the horses that will be lining up. Here's the leaderboard presented by Spendthrift, that victory in the Bluegrass Sierra Leone vaulted to the top, and you look yet yeah, near the bottom of that list. So, uh, T.O. password. No matter what Hades does, he is in. He has that uh, invite being from Japan, but Mystic Dan, no more time. I'm not sure endlessly if they've decided yet on Derby or not, but no more time would be the one who's certainly in danger if Hades were to win. Um, he would jump that horse, he'd have more points, but we'll see what happens you know, with endlessly as well if they decide to uh, stay on turf on Derby Day or if they line up in the big one. It's a hard race to try and pass up. And you, when you have the opportunity to go, I completely understand wanting to take it. Whether or not you really think that horse is going to win that race, you want to be a part of those festivities because it is that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for many people. But at the same time, I think they know that this horse is better on another surface and that might not be his best opportunity for success. Meanwhile, for Hades, to win, this, win and you're in, basically, in this Lexington, won the first three starts of his career, including the grade three Holy Bowl, not just in the in the Lexington, but going forward, if he were able to get in, what do you think of his chances against the group that we're looking at? I don't know. I mean, I think he's a horse that had things go his own way in this race when he was able to upset Furiousness, and we saw Furiousness not have things go his way and not have the same kind of brilliant performance that we know that he's capable of, that we saw in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and that we saw him come back with in the Florida Derby. And clearly, Haiti has has some ability, but. He also got to set an extremely slow pace in this race, was able to last over horses that were just really spinning their wheels and not making up much ground. And then he didn't run quite as well in his subsequent start. So I just don't know if he quite classes up, but I understand wanting to take that shot if you're on the outside looking in with another victory. If you could get into that starting gate, if you think you have a real chance, I completely understand wanting to take it. He's got to do it first. He's got to win the Lexington. But even if he were to do that, there is no chance on earth he will be able to set the kind of fractions he did in the Holy Bull when he beat Fierceness in the Kentucky Derby. They're going to go, <laughs> even if Fierceness didn't exist and wasn't in that race, everyone's so amped up in that race, you're, the pace is just usually much hotter than expected. Right. You would be extremely surprised if he was able to go that slow and really back things down on the front end like he did. And I think that he needs to prove that he can win without doing so. Back to our Thursday action here in New York. Third race post parade here coming up. $40,000 claiming race all for sale for that price. Horses who only have a maiden win to their credit. So non-winners at two life, six and a half furlong sprint coming up. And the favorite we'll see first. Bobby the Tank, Linda Rice. This horse is coming back on short rest and we know that this is a move that Linda Rice does well. 12 to one next door. Michelle Nevin claims off of Linda Rice. This is a horse that has some races that would make him competitive in this spot. Big price right now. That was favored in that win. That was state bred 30 maiden claiming. Here's Sin Nombre, Jesus Romero. First off claim. His last race wasn't bad facing winners for the first time, but his win was a dead heat with another rival in this field. Just don't know how good he is. David Jacobson and a horse who broke his maiden last time out out of town. That was at Laurel. His form was sort of falling off the map and he met a weak field last time, but he does have races to go back to at the maiden special weight level that would have made him very competitive in here. It's been a struggle against winners for this horse so far solo in Paris. And he's just getting some class relief because he hasn't been able to quite step up to that next level after that big maiden win. Mazzara, for Wayne Potts, was with Todd Pletcher, and he broke his maiden for Pletcher at odds on last start. And he goes first off the claim for Wayne Potts, and I wonder if they're going to try to get him to be forward in here because he was effective doing so last time. Don't get too excited. Seven to two will not last on Giants Fire. John Terranova. This horse is just way the horse to beat. I, I don't get all the money coming in on Bobby the Tank instead of him. Many races better than these in the past. Nice appearance warming up, too. We'll see what Acacia thinks momentarily. And then Dolly's Bank, 13 to one outside Romero Mirage Board. 
got the win last time. Career best 61 buyer speed figure on the cutback in distance. Can he do it again? Board says not so much. And excuse me, it's Mig joining us right now. So we're going to head downstairs first time on the program on this Thursday to Richard Migliori. He'll give us his thoughts on the field. Mig. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And uh, we'll start with the four horse. Uh, excellent man. This horse just broke his maiden uh, for 45. But boy, you want to talk about a big strap and son of Mendelssohn here. Just really carrying great weight. Uh, David Jacobson and Isaac Castillo has proved to be a, a, a really good combination. Isaac Castillo, a very welcome addition to the jockey colony here, rides a very smart race. And I was really impressed with the way this horse jogged off great extension and fluidity to his stride like what I saw there the six uh, Muzara will be my top selection uh, another one that just broke his maiden dropped to the $40,000 level uh, for the first time and just what Sarah said um, doesn't appear to be a tremendous amount of speed on paper here uh, and d even uh, discussing it with uh, Wayne Potts the conditioner you know he feels like he wants his horse up on the pace so I, I think that gives a horse an advantage in a race that seemingly uh, doesn't have a lot of pace and he could not look any better he is as well turned out as anybody in this race you get an apprentice um so that you're getting a five pound break in the weights and this is the right kind of horse for an apprentice too a horse that you don't have to make a lot of decisions you break clean break sharp get out of their way and let them do their thing and his dapples have dapples could not look any better and the seven or giants fire taken to the dropping class should make this horse very competitive for john terranova uh like what i saw from him just prefer the horse inside him a little bit at a much better price Wow, eight to one on a horse who, at least speed figure wise, would need to take a big leap forward in moving out of a Hall of Fame barn. And horses leaving the Todd Pletcher barn, you're always a little bit hesitant to take them regardless of where they go because you know that they're leaving such a capable outfit and it's not an indictment on anyone else's ability, but it's just hard to claim off of certain trainers. And he is stepping up a little bit in terms of class based on the tag that he broke his maiden for. Usually you want to cut them in half after they break their maiden in terms of price tag. And he's staying at that $40,000 level that he broke his maiden at but I do think that if they use his early speed like they used last time it could help him at least be in the mix in this race because I agree with Richie I don't really see a lot of horses that have established that they want to have forward position in this race we're going to go back and look at good reunion in here Michelle Nevin and this is another horse claimed off a very good trainer Linda Rice equaled the record for wins on the New York circuit last year, as we showed you in that feature, coming off a win last start, was favored, was expected to get this win. This was against State Bread Maiden 30. And it was a dead heat win with Sinombre and a good race from both of them, but he was a horse that he'd had his opportunities to get that first win of his career. He'd run well in each start oh, in the past, but you were kind of getting a little bit tired of taking him at a short price when he does finally get this one victory. And he's going to be up against it a little bit in terms of pace. He's a horse that likes to come from further back. And with a race without much pace in it at this sprint distance, now moving to a new barn, I was a little bit cold on him coming in here facing winners for the first time. Nine to one. Right now on, on good reunion. So we'll see if how he fares. I should say in this first start against winners coming up. The horse who dead heated with him in that race came back to win or run second, I should say, against 16 non-winners of two and then claimed off a right handle and kind of an aggressive move to jump up to 40. And this isn't a trainer that really claims a ton of horses either. So clearly they liked something that they saw from that race where he was going out behind Mudville 9 and Look, he, he had, makes some sense, but he's another one. He had had his chances to break his maiden. He isn't really necessarily that horse that's going to be up and on the pace. And that was a much softer field last time. Get a $20 bonus today by playing with Nauer Bets. Bet at least $100 each on Aqueduct and Keeneland. You'll get that $20 bonus win or lose. You do have to opt in at NauerBets.com. So take advantage of that by playing with Nauer Bets as we take a look at Giants Fire. And you know, this horse at least had some tactical ability to be close you know, a few starts back, we did not see that um, the last few starts. I know a couple of those races were on grass as well, but the last couple of dirt starts, not the case. When you look at the kind of horses that he has faced relative to this field, those are graded stakes quality horses that he's run into throughout his career. Provocateur, um, Opportunity Set, Easter, Añejo, Substational, Bold Journey. I mean, these are horses that are just so much better than anybody that he's really going to be facing in this spot. And now they're just 
taking that drop in class with him for the first time. So now the money sort of makes more sense, right? The nine to five on him. Uh, deserving favor. I'm, yeah, he, he's faced a lot better. I don't know if they're that good. <laughs> Graded stakes type horses. Compared to this but they're field, good. I mean. Yeah, um, definitely the horse to beat. No question. Um, we'll see how Lane Leslie fares for John Terranova. And a very, I, Terranova Barnes, so good, so trustworthy, too. He usually has them ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And he was off a layoff last time as well, running fourth behind a better field than this. Not even a bad performance in there. He just has a lot of races that make him better. See if he can get it done as the 9-5 to five choice is 7. Giants fire off the bench since February 9th. There he is backing away from the gate momentarily. That had a really nice warm-up. We're set for the third six and a half furlong sprint. Still doesn't want to go in. See if the starting gate crew gets him calmed down. Send it upstairs to Chris Griffin for the call. Giants fire right at the gate, then backed off. Excellent men, Dolly's Bank, last to load. In it. All set. Got it. And they're off. Excellent men's got early speed from in between horses. Mozara's in the early mix as well. And at the rail, here comes Bobby the Tank to apply pressure. Bobby the Tank is now a neck in front. Mozara's going to track from second and back to third. That's Excellent Men, who shoved along. is trying to keep up with the early tempo. There's Giants Fire. Blue Cap to the outside is now moving up and taking third. Back there in fifth comes Good Reunion. Tight hold here is in the fifth position as they approach four furlongs left to go. Sinombre is towards the tail end of the field with Solo and Paris. And the trailer is Dolly's Bank, 22-1, and one, a pumped-up opening quarter mile. Bobby the Tank and Mozara, they throw it down here in the early stages, well into the far turn. There is Excellent Men is traveling there with Giants Fire. The favorite is going to hold that position there. Is going to be three wide approaching the leaders from the back, trying to rally on as well. Here comes a run, tipping to the outside, Kendra Carmouche and Good Reunion. They're on the move, and they've caught up to the leaders quickly. Now within a length of the lead, they reach the top of the stretch. Mozara is trying to shug off the inside run of Bobby the Tank, but he here comes that sustained rally from Good Reunion, and Good Reunion has taken the front. It's Good Reunion. Sinombre from way out of it is rallying on late as well. It's Good Reunion approaches the 16th pole. Muzara, Giants, Fire, and Sinombre, they're all chasing Good Reunion. Kicks off the pick six at 8-1. to one. Good Reunion wins it over Giants, Fire, Muzara, and Sinombre finish fourth. And woman, it's 16 and four. Eight to one upset, long way to go, but on our way to a carryover in the pick six. One leg in, Kendra Carmouche, <laughs> Michelle Nevin claims off of Linda Rice, and now back-to-back -back wins for this four-year-old. He was traveling so well into the turn of this race, and sometimes when you have a lack of confirmed speed on paper, you get a little bit more of it out on the racetrack, and I think that's what happened here with Bobby the Tank and Muzara being more aggressively handled, but you could always tell that he was traveling comfortably, stayed out in the clear, out of trouble, and was just moving so much better than anybody else at this point to be able to get that victory for the new barn. And you could tell pretty early on he was going to be your winner of the way he was traveling in this race here. Eight to one running shoes on today for good reunion. Moving to a new barn. And same result as last time out. Maybe even more impressive in this spot. Eight to one upset beating an eight to five favorite to start off this pick six on our Thursday card. Here in New York, Kendra Carmouche aboard for the win. We're going to take a timeout. 2763. Here in the third, Jackie, Katie, Dylan, all competing against each other. Siblings on this New York circuit and following in dad's footsteps, who had over 3,300 winners in his career. We'll hear their story when we come back on our FS2 coverage. Number one is Mo Donegal by Uncle Mo. And they're off in the Remsen. As they come on for the finish, and it's going to be tight here in the Remsen. Mo Donegal. Mo Donegal bearing down on the outside. It's Mo Donegal and early voting, and it is Mo Donegal. 
to win the Wood Memorial. And it will be Mo Donegal to win the Test of the Champion, the Belmont Stakes. Experience the adrenaline-pumping, suspense-filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Tonalist, a four-time grade one winner with 11 triple-digit buyers, including the Belmont Stakes and the Cigar Mile. He's already living up to his potential as a sire with multiple graded stakes winners, including grade one winner Country Grammar and grade two winner Tonalist Shape, plus multiple six-figure yearling and two-year-old sales. Proven on the track, proven in the sales ring. Tonalist, standing at lane's end. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race. from every track, every track, on every screen, every, screen. Every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. Sports 2 coverage brought to you in part by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. Good reunion. Starts off the pick six on our Thursday card with Kendra Carmouche for Michelle Nevin. First off the claim, let's head downstairs to Mig. Kendrick, you gave the source a real nice trip. Always looked like he was traveling well up underneath you. Yeah, he warmed up good. Michelle told me to keep him with the pony, jog him a little bit, let him break and let him get his feet underneath him. She said, don't change the way you ride him. Um, I think he runs best that way. And, you know, he broke real sharp and they had some horses wanting to be in front of him. But I know this horse has to be outside a little whenever, you know, we get to the running. And once I got him outside at the three pool, man, he was traveling good. I was just waiting to pull the trigger to go to the winner's circle. Kendrick, you had ridden another horse in here, Muzara, that won last time. Who makes those final decisions? Is that your agent, or do you guys get together and talk about, you know, who you should stick with? Uh, you know, my agent, I leave it up to him. You know, he, he, he had some great riders in the past. I'm sure he done good by them. And um, I feel like he, you know, having me and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm later in my career where it's in my prime. I shouldn't have much to say. He should know what I want. I like that a lot. That's a good answer there. You've been riding so well for an extended period of time. What, what, what's the key to being as consistent as you've been? Uh, wanting to get to the next level, Richie. Um, I've been doing it for 23 years. I've been riding hard day in, day out. Um, I just finished second in the championship behind Dylan Davis. I reward him. He's, he, he, he worked hard for it just like me. I would love to have that, but... I think I want more. I think I deserve more. I think I've been in this game long enough. I put in a lot of work. I'm still putting in work. I'm still learning my craft each day I go out there, which is most important for not only the owners, but for the trainers and myself to keep succeeding in this game. Um, I've been all over the world. I think in my mind, I didn't accomplish as much as I can just by me doing it. All the help that I can get that's going to come in the near future, it will help me get to the next level. Well, to me, you're already at the next level. You're a pleasure to watch ride. But, guys, that's the hunger that keeps you going forward. And Kendrick Carmouche, he's got all, got all the talent and the hunger. Louisiana, baby. And he's always had, you talk about how long he's been riding. It seems like he, he's, he's a newbie in this game just because of his energy and his enthusiasm. But an incredibly polished rider who paid his dues, all those riding titles at parks where he really honed his craft. And now he's one of the top riders in the toughest colony there is. And he has the fan base here, right? Especially at Aqueduct. He has that enthusiasm and that energy, and it's contagious with the people that come out to see him and bet on his horses. He always has somebody in the stands yelling for Kendrick. $19.20 for the victory here. Good reunion. Kendrick on board for both those wins for the different barns. Why not keep him on? Got it done last time, does it again here. And that's how we start in the pick six with an eight to five favorite beat.
kicking things off. But with a father who rode over 3,300 winners in his career, the Davis kids grew up seeing what the life of a jockey was like, and apparently they liked what they saw. The entire family is involved in the game with Robbie's daughters, Jackie and Katie, and son, Dylan, all competing against each other on the Naira circuit. So happy. Take care of this old man. You had to have a very understanding woman that is behind you and will support you 110%. And I prayed, God, please, there's got to be one out there. And she was at the roller skating rink. She said she climbed the tree in 1973 and watched Secretariat win in her backyard at the quarter pole at Belmont. I was like, wow, you climbed a tree? We got married and we had two little girls. And I said, I don't care if you have a dozen. We had three boys and three girls. I have an older sister with three lovely little girls and my sister Jackie that rides here and Finger Lakes. I have a brother, Robbie Jr., and then Eddie that is working for Billy Mont right now. Then it's me and then my little brother Dylan. Big family. <laughs> I'm the oldest of everybody that's on the track. The younger daughter says, well, she can do it, I can do it, I know I can. I'm the youngest in the family. I was second one. It was a pretty easy choice because knowing that dad rode and I had my own little personal coach to teach me along the way. My dad wasn't exactly thrilled about being in racing. Jackie, you're, you're 99 to one. You'll never make it, you're this big. So he was really, really hard on me. She went to McCarran's jockey school. I said, Chris, look, you know, it's just a whim she's on. You know, she'll fall off once or twice. And then so he calls me at Christmas, says, Rob, she's good. She's really good. I said, Chris, come on. He's like, no, Rob, she can ride. I'm going, oh, brother. We're very competitive, so we tease a lot. There was bragging rights, you know, and it's sometimes some people don't, don't take it better than others. All of us have ridden in a race before, and I've won most of them. We will do anything to beat each other for any, any position we're in. It doesn't matter if it's last. Yeah, it's hard. I don't know who to root for, you know? I'm just like, get across there, say. The winning is everything. If I can't win the race, I want to beat my siblings. It's kind of like they're in the backyard, but they just moved over here. And this is their backyard. I look over, I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, I never thought that we would actually be here together, you know, enjoying the moment. We want to beat each other, but we want to see each other do well. It's always tough competition when we're out there, and, and we have a lot of fun. They are having a great time. They are absolutely love every bit of what they're doing. They absolutely love it. I think my dad is proud. To be able to follow in his footsteps, he's really proud. He kind of paved the way for us, and uh, he knows that we love doing this sport. It's beyond proud. It's, it's just beyond it. They have outshined me in everything that I ever dreamed of. It's grateful, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful. Just an incredible story and to see how, I mean, you, you can tell just listening to Robbie Davis talk how proud he is of, of his children. And they've had not just incredible success on the circuit, they've had success riding for dad. And he's just so genuine. You can really tell that he it is this family affair for them. And he is just so proud of all of their accomplishments. And even if they're not winning every single race, they're just going out there. They're doing the thing that they love. And you can tell that he just really has an appreciation for that. And he's passed that on to them. Dylan, of course, coming off that meet title, Aqueduct winter meet, picked right up where he left off. He took the early double on today's card. He is on a roll right now as we move along in this card here. That third in the books, start to the pick six. It was good reunion. Kendra Carmouche ending uh, Dylan Davis's run, sweeping the card here, getting that victory. And we'll see what happens going forward here. Dylan with a big mount later, uh, coming up in the fifth race. We're going to see him again within view. Big class dropper for Ray Handel. Mig going to join us again and take us inside the starting eight. Tell us why a clean break is so crucial to any horse's success. We'll have that when we come back.
post. The barrier. The stalls. The iron monster. The starting gate. There are so many key and important times in a race where jockeys have to make quick decisions, when to move, when to sit, wait behind horses. But to me, one of the most critical times in a race is leaving the starting gate. If you don't break cleanly, you can get shuffled back, taken out of position, and it's hard to get a horse in a good rhythm. Starts are so important. I want you to know what goes on inside the starting gate. Come on with me. Where are we doing? Hey, we're from the front. All right, good. Yeah. yeah. The key to breaking sharp from the gate is having your horse warmed up, alert, but settled. You want them relaxed. We've got a great gate crew here in New York, and they know all the horses, their habits, what to expect. Put them in the gate, get them square, looking down the track, and be ready to go. I try to get as relaxed as I can on my horse before we go in the gate. And once I get in there, I want to let him walk in and take a deep breath and make sure the gate guy get up because I want to make sure he, he, he starts setting his feet correctly. And um, you know the ones that's going to sit in there and be still, but I just, want to, I just want to keep it as relaxed as I can going into the gate with the horse where the horse can feel like he's going to do his job. I'm going to just stay out of his way. You get one that cuts right to the gate, sometimes they'll balk. It's a, kind of a closed space. Some horses are a little claustrophobic. Important to pick up your feet so you don't get your legs caught on the side of the gate. You could feel their energy. Sometimes you'll feel their, their heartbeat beating on your leg. Again, want to keep them relaxed, settled, get them square. The assistant starters are so good at getting a horse nice and balanced. Sometimes you get one that's leaning a little too far, you'll take your leg, push off the petition, get them where you want them to be. Looking down the racetrack, all four legs square on the ground. Last horse gets ready to go in, you're going to take your half cross, take a piece of mane, one hand, other hand free, in case horse breaks left or right, you can correct them, and you're gonna be leaving here in a hurry. Well, a lot of people wait on the guys to say one out to get all set and ready, you know. I'm, I'm not, you know, you can hear the guy say one out, but I'm mostly paying attention to the guy with the button. That's how I break so fast out the gate, you know. I'm a button guy, you know. Or I listen to the last door sound and the button. And after that, early position wins the race most of the time. So many moving parts that make a horse break well or break poorly. It's important to have great communication between the rider and the assistant starters as well as the official starter. And working with the trainers to make sure that if a horse is a little bit nervous, they school them, they get them where they're relaxed around the gate. It's not always the horse that's the most keyed up that breaks the best. It's the horse that's alert and settled and balanced in the gate. Then you can leave the gate in a hurry. It's a great piece by Mig, and, and there it is, the Iron Monster, as he calls it. But a clean break, so crucial to having success in the sport. And I think you never realize just how big and imposing the starting gate is until you have those races where the start is a little bit closer to where you're standing, and you're like, oh, it's actually that large and a little bit intimidating. And you have to get out of the gate cleanly to get your position going forward, as Richie always says, and he always put that example into good use. Well, let's get it uh, firsthand from Mig. Mig, uh, I know for you that was fun because it was the first time getting back on a horse in, in some time here, but tell us more about what made you so successful in, in your ability to get a horse calm or whatever you needed to do, get a horse break and be where you needed to be in a race. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Greg, because we were actually talking about this earlier in my office uh, and how much it's changed from when I started riding way back in, you know, 1980. Back then, not every horse was handled by an assistant starter. You got put in the gate and they left. And unless you, you know, were having a hard time and then you'd have to ask the, ask the official starter, uh, sir, can I please get a hand in here? And sometimes you would get help and sometimes he would say, you take care of it yourself, Jock, you know, straighten him up. And you learned how to square a horse up, how to get them all balanced. You think about a thousand pound animal with four legs going from zero to 35 miles an hour in a matter of two strides. And if they're put, putting too much weight on one leg or another and they're not completely balanced, they're going to break left or right. And I think that now that every horse gets handled, riders don't learn as intensively how to really balance a horse out. And I think that lends to some of the raggedy starts we see where you see horses going left or right and you know losing their balance 
balance a little bit. So key is having a horse square, all four legs distributing their weight evenly, and then a horse can really leave the gate forward. And it's so important to get position. So many horses get discouraged easily from the kickback or body contact. They get the air knocked out of them. If you break clean and get your position going forward, a horse will get in a good rhythm, and it builds up their confidence. So essential with all horses, but even more so with lower-level horses that tend to get discouraged a bit more easily. That's such a great piece for me. I, I love watching and learn something new every time I see it. Nine minutes to post in this forthcoming up start of the late pick five. And with midday image coming out in here, it's probably the quickest of the quick in here. Who takes command on the front end? Well, I think another horse coming out of here, Poppy's Pride, really helps Capone get to the front end and be that horse that is your pace setter, a horse that is taking a significant drop in class in this spot. And I think with him, you have to imagine that he's going to be that horse on the front end early. To me, it was a little bit of a red flag taking that big drop after trying to stretch out. This is a smart and capable outfit. They don't sort of experiment like they are right now. Have you never been to the Gangster Museum in Hot Springs? No, I haven't. Okay. Why? What were you going to say? I think it's Capone, no? <laughs> I, people have kept saying Capone, and I thought it was always Capone, and I always thought they were wrong, too, but, you know. <sighs> Post sure. parade coming up shortly. Nine to five favorite is the horse in our screen right now, the five dots dollar. This horse, there was a run where it looked like this horse might be really, really good for a while. And then it just has not panned out. It's continued to drop down the class ladder as we take another look, Derek Capone, uh, five to two. Jose Gomez for Detro, and Detro continuing to give um, Jose Gomez as he transitions into this journeyman phase of his career, a lot of big opportunities. Absolutely, and, and he's a rider that has success when he's aggressive as well and can get those horses to have more of that early position that we just talked about making a difference in races like this. And you can see that he is a horse that likes to be forward. This was a day where he was successful and a smart ride by Jose Gomez. Uh, to, well, actually, it was Manny Franco aboard this day, but maybe Jose Gomez realizing that, hey, this is a horse that likes to do his best running when he's forwardly placed, and we're probably going to try to do that again today. I just wonder why they tried to stretch him out last time at Laurel. He should have been a little bit more effective in either of those last two spots. To get back to this race makes him much the best in here, but those last two efforts have not been very good. And we know he's quick too, but yeah, they stretched him out last start. Sometimes stretching a horse out like that takes away some of their speed and dulls it a little bit. Is he still going to be that quick? I mean, I think... <sighs> It's likely just based on the fact that anybody else that was going to be forward in this race is no longer here. I mean, you have a horse like Hatch who can have some forward position, but isn't necessarily that need the lead front running type. And I think things do go his way early on. Pick five, by the way, starting here. We're already underway in the pick six. So late pick five pool. Um, I believe 63,000 plus and growing in this fourth race here coming up. So we'll get that corrected here in a moment as we take a look here at the three. Hatch for Jimmy Ferraro, who uh, two back, if he can repeat that race somehow, does that put him in the mix? I think so. I think he's a little tough to trust and whether he's not one of those mid 70s to the low 80s type of buyer horses or whether he really is that middle ground mid 60s because that's not going to get it done here. But he has races that could put him in the mix. I didn't think he was going to be too far out of it early. Call the post, and we'll kick things off with Clem Labine from the inside. David Jacobson, Isaac Castillo. He really did not get out of the gate all that well in his last start against a bias two back. Has some excuses and possibly could be better than his last two races indicate. Off the claim, claimed off a of Rob Atris here. This is Cajun Casanova. Goes to a different barn now and steps up a little bit in terms of the field that he's going to be facing, but his last couple races haven't been too bad. There's Hatch. Eight to one on the gray. Completely overmatched in his last start. That was a spot that was just unrealistic for his ability and does drop back down in class. Dots Dollar had a run of about four or five races. You know, 2022, early 2023, looked like he was going to be a very good sprinter. It just did not work out for him. He has just been precipitously dropping down the class ladder, and I just don't know what his level of ability is anymore. 
Capone, Rick Dutra, Jose Gomez. We know he's quick. Will he be as quick getting back to sprinting? I mean, this is a big drop in class for a horse that was running against much tougher company. Do they just use his speed and go, or is this drop kind of a red flag? And oh, trouble. New bar now was claimed off of David Jacobson. And off a significant layoff as well. A horse that had been running against some tougher company in the past has some ability, but might need to start. And Kendra Carmouche outside. Don't be late. Another horse who likes to be forward for Jeremiah Englehart. Goes to a new barn now after a run of solid performances in the Randy Persaud barn. If he can get back to some of those races, could be effective. So four minutes away. Fourth race here coming up. Start of this pick five as we take a look again at uh, Clem Labine. Was in for this $16,000 level. It's been a precipitous drop down in class. 50, 32, 16. And this is a look at his start last time out. I mean, you can completely just draw a line through this race. He had no opportunity to be effective, really, following that start. You can tell he's last early. He's taken out of the race running in the early stages. And even if you go to his race two back, he was wide. That was a day that you wanted to be more towards the inside. One by C's get degrees and just a better group of horses than he's facing today. And when you look at his race three starts ago, it was a tough field that he was running into. Horses like Emerald Forest, Life Changer, Amundsen, who we saw come back and win earlier today. So he's just getting some class relief. And with a cleaner start, he could be a horse that's picking up some pieces in the later stages of this race. Yeah, still is a horse who wants a little bit of help up front. Nine to one right now in the remaining half of the entry. Let's go down to Mig. It out our audio uh, with MIG. Get back to him in a moment as we take a look here at the five dots dollar. And you know, even though we say dots dollar, he, like, he was running 95 buyers, 88 buyers, and winning against so much better, even though he's not that horse anymore. Dropping down to the lowest level he's been at in his career. I mean, this pro could be the level where, say, finally. He's found the right spot. Yeah, you might say that this is the time where he's found his friends, so to speak. But at the same time, we also have just really seen that he's not quite that horse that he used to be when he was running some of his bigger races in the past. And you have to wonder a little bit, what are you going to get from him coming in here? A horse that also is one that likes to come from a little bit off the pace, too, and might need some help on the front end. Two to one second choice. Don Stoller, Jose Lascano will be aboard. Let's get back to Mig. All right, guys, let's do take two here. Uh, was getting back to the five dots dollar. Looks tremendous. Great impression in the paddock. Terrific impression on the racetrack warming up. I was going back and forth between picking the five dots dollar and the eight don't be late. Ultimately, I will land on don't be late, but they both have to be the six Capone. Uh, and I have no problem with Capone being a horse. Capone sounds appropriate. Uh, but Capone has speed. He's taking that precipitous drop in class uh, and doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of speed sign on here. I will be honest with you, I wish his coat wasn't quite as dry as it was in the paddock. Maybe it means nothing, and maybe that's not out of character for him. But at 6-5, to five, I'm going to take a shot with horses that I just preferred a little bit from a physical perspective. And the one that stood out was the 8, Don't Be Late, making his first start uh, for Jeremiah Inglehart. was claimed for Manny Prasad. It's never an indictment. Well, well, I guess I'm going back now with the 5, Dots Dollar, because I'm hearing that the 8 is going to be a late defection here. Was very well turned out in the paddock. Just probably didn't warm up to Kendrick Carmouche's satisfaction. Always better to are on the side of caution. So we get back to Dots Dollar. I just love the way he looks, and he's a little better priced than the 6 to 5 on Capone. And uh, Capone just didn't check the boxes for me, guys. Uh, I, I, I thought he looked a little bit dry, like I said, but the big drop in class, he should be tough to beat. And there's Don't Be Late. So back to the barn, scratch of the eight, who could have shown, I don't know if he's as quick as, as Capone in here, but was going to try and be forward in this race. So he's out as we get another look here at Dot's dollar, two to one. And Mig, bit of an indictment in terms of the physical appearance of your favorite, Capone. And I think that that's important to bring up because this is a horse that was facing much tougher company over his last couple of races and running numbers that would absolutely crush here. But then he has that race where he's favored. He doesn't run very well, running a 49 by regressing significantly off of that 93 that he could run in a starter allowance. And then they try to stretch him out in distance. Well, 
this is a horse that had never really gone beyond the seven furlongs on the dirt in his career. And this is not a barn that's going to just mess around with different ideas if they have something that's working well. So I kind of wonder why they decided to make those changes with this horse. Maybe that's just the spot that came up. But to me, it's a little bit of a negative to see them try different things with him after he had been so successful going through his conditions earlier. Has not scared away the public, even no. money. <laughs> On that one right there, Capone Jose Gomez for the Dutro Barn. Huge drop down in class. And, you know, nine to five on Dots Dollar. We saw this horse not only be effect win for 25000 you know, back at Aqueduct late last year in November. It just seems like this spot is going to be very effective. But usually you're not dealing with a class dropper of this level um, with the six when you line up in a race like this. Precisely. I mean, if this was a different day, he could be the one that is the six to five rather than the second choice that he is. Seems like it's those two. Anyone else outside of that group? Yeah, I went, with, I went with Hatch. I think okay. that he's he's a little bit inconsistent, but last time that he was in a spot that was way too tough for him, he can be a little bit more forward. If your favorite doesn't show up, I think that he's going to be sitting in the right kind of position. We'll see if this one can make a run from well off the pace and if you get a better break today as well. We showed you that poor break last time out for Clem Labine. For the Jacobson Barn, there's Cajun Casanova stepping in. Six to five favorite. Capone, the big drop down in class. Jose Gomez for the Dutro Barn. Late pick five on this Thursday card. Starts here. Let's go to Chris Griffin for the call. Dots dollar. Capone. Oh, trouble to the outside. Oh, trouble. Ellie Sale Ruiz. They go in. All set. Good speed from Capone to the outside, and there's Dots Dollar. They hook up one, two, just off of them. That's going to be the gray. It's Hatch. Out wider is the other gray. Oh, Trouble is starting to progress forward now. Is in the fourth position alone as the front two get away, and Capone and Jose Gomez, they assert they're a quick length in front now as Dots Dollar, Jose Lescano, looked over his right shoulder, now moves out towards second. Is a length and a half off the leader with four furlongs left to travel. Hatch is out in the center of the racetrack in third, then Oh, Trouble far back to the trailing two. Cajun Casanova with Clem Labine. They're chasing Capone. Capone's got the lead. It's Capone who's up by a full length. Dots Dollar in pursuit here from second. There's Hatch from third. Oh, Trouble is not cutting in the margin yet. It's five off the lead. Clem Labine and Cajun Casanova try to get going from the back end of the field as the two favorites hook up again at the top of the stretch. To the inside, it's Capone. To the outside, it's Dots Dollar. And Dots Dollar has now put a nose in front, but Capone is very game. Still comes right back towards the inside, inside the final furlong. Hatch trying to catch them both. Here's Capone one more time after Dots Dollar. Dots Dollar trying to hold off a very resilient Capone who comes back towards the inside. Capone, Dots Dollar, it's a photo finish. Tight photo there, two noses on the line. Dots Dollar and Capone, and Hatch finished third in today's fourth. Two most logical runners we expected to be there in the end in a photo finish, you want to call it? No, that was tight. I, I really thought that Capone was coming back towards the inside, but Dots Dollar might have got the better Bob. That's as close a photo, at least at first glance, that you're going to see. I mean, these two, for a lower level race, I mean, this was exciting. These two really threw it down, battled all the way to the wire. Yeah, two pretty good horses who used to be very good. And so difficult from this end. Wow, They're that like is close. They're matching strides, too. It's not even that one of them's getting yeah. a better bob. Tough what to tell with the naked eye from that angle. I mean, I don't see many where I say, I think that could be a dead heat. That could be a dead heat. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I mean. They're so in sync coming down to the wire as well. It's not as though one of them is a little bit ahead of the other. They're, they're right in sync there. And we're hearing that it was Capone who ended up getting his nose wow. down in time. Six to five favorite. Just barely posted as your unofficial winner here. Six, five, three, seven. Incredibly close. And Jose Gomez on Capone for the Dutch Barn here out dueling the veteran, Jose Lascano.
Yeah, I mean, he was on a horse that had that early speed that we knew he would have, maybe a little bit of a concern whether or not it would be dulled by that routing experience, but just the class relief that he was getting and the aggressive ride. He was so much the best in here in terms of just where he was going to be in this race. But Dot's dollar, I mean, he gave him a run for his money. It really showed up today. Not many races Jose Lascano was lost early on at this meet. He's an incredible start. Runner-up finish here, but he came in 44% early on here in this spring meet. Comes close, just misses here as he gets Dot's dollar to really show up. But Capone, big class drop, able to get the win. Barely get a look at this photo <laughs> hopefully soon. It was not by much. Right? I mean, you can tell he's in front there. Dot's dollar coming after him. It's got to be a close photo that we'll see. Impossible angle for <laughs> us to try and make that call. Uh, but it's Capone as the favorite here to start off this late pick five. Fourth career win for Capone. Again, Gomez, Dutro, NK Racing, LNJ, Foxwoods. A thriller to start this late pick five on our Thursday coverage. We'll be back. because you're not going to see this too often, maybe never again. Flightline, 20 lengths clear. World-class racehorse, world-class performance, and a world championship event. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. I'm here with Jose Gomez, who rode the winner of race number four, Capone. He showed a lot of determination today. He's a horse that's been successful when he's been kind of clear, but he had a fight for it today. Showed a lot of fight. Yeah, um, I took, took a look at the race. Uh, the only horse that was uh, that I had to look out for was the five. And yeah, I mean, luckily we broke good. We were out in front pretty easily. He was doing it really well. And when that five, he was able to see that five, he, he, he was gaming and fought to the end. Yeah, go figure, a horse named Capone is a fighter, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> now, we, we were talking off camera. You had an unfortunate incident not too long ago. You were disqualified on Messier in the Excelsior handicap. How difficult is it to shake that off? I know for me as a rider, it, it, it would stay with me, it would eat at me. But the fact that uh, you know Rick Dutro is stuck with you has got to give you a lot of confidence. Of course, yeah, that, that's a big thing. You know, Nobody likes getting taken down, especially in big races like that. One worries about, you know, maybe will I get another chance, you know? But luckily, Rick's been really, real good to me, you know, we still work in a lot. And I mean, as far as, you know, moving on, just gotta turn the page, you know, we got more races to ride, you know, more horses to get on, just gotta keep looking forward. Jose, I've been really impressed with how much stronger you've gotten physically. Have you started doing something different or is it just the physical maturity? Well, yeah, the more we ride, the, the stronger you get. And of course, you got to put in work outside of this. So it's just a little bit of everything, you know, just kind of coming together. 
But you're doing a great job. Keep it up, guys. An Eclipse Award winning apprentice jockey who's kept the beat on going. He's got Angel Cordero Jr., arguably the greatest jockey in history on his side. So we expect good things. Yeah, good man to have as your mentor trying to uh, learn the ropes on this incredibly tough circuit. And he has really started to get, I mean, he was making a lot of noise. Obviously, that's why he won in the Eclipse as, as an apprentice. But he's starting to really show that he's fitting into this colony now as a journeyman. He has. He's been able to develop that business going forwards and really continue to ride at a capable level to be competitive on this circuit. And he's done well for himself so far. He always has such a positive attitude as well. All right, so here's how close it was. Whew. It's tight. That has got to sting to lose photos like that. Absolutely. And you were, you, I mean, you were spot on. They were stride for stride. They were in sync. I just mean, completely. One's head is a little bit bigger than the other, I guess. <laughs> but Capone able to get it done, put that nose down at the right time. Fifth race starts the late pick four. Seven for longs here. New York Preds, $30,000 maiden claiming race, all trying to get that first win of their career, all for sale for that $30,000 price. And this board looks wide open within view. Dylan Davis back to work here, looking to add a third win today. And Horse dropping down a class for a handle. He makes a lot of sense coming back into this spot and didn't even run that poorly in his last start against Tougher. So this is just a logical drop in class for him. I enjoyed it. I did too. We had a good time. All right. Well, I'm going to be joined by Andy Serling uh, after a short timeout. We'll talk more about what's coming up this weekend and the rest of this card ahead as well. Wet paint returning. Coaching Club American Oaks winner from last year. It's going to be her four-year-old debut in grade one company in the Apple Blossom. You'll see it live on Fox Sports coverage this weekend. We'll have a preview ahead. Everybody, welcome to Claiborne Farm. Claiborne Farm has been around since 1910. The tour is a backstage look at how we operate as a large scale breeding farm. These are parts of the farm that have always been off limits to the public. You know, you would only see these barns and these horses up close if you worked out here. So it's been really exciting to open that to the public to show that end of the industry and just spread that knowledge. You know, you take a group out, they get to scratch on a mare in full, they think it's super cool and hopefully create a lifelong fan. 
So our stallions stand from anywhere from $5,000 to $100,000. That is a stand and nurse guarantee. So that fee is not paid until the next year after the mare has had her baby, the full stands and everything is good. We have conceived 22 Kentucky Derby winners, 19 Preakness winners, 22 Belmont winners, and 29 Breeders' Cup winners. In addition to that, six of the 13 Triple Crown winners have been conceived in our breeding shed. So I'm always excited to, you know, spread the knowledge that I've had, share this passion for the breeding industry that I've had my, you know, basically my entire life and just spread the wealth. Basically all of our tours are sold out. That's just absolutely fantastic. Sometimes we'll try to sneak in one or two extra people onto the trolley. It's a yearling, a yearling colt field. Actually, this field is home of 2013 Kentucky Derby winner Orb, as well as Breeders Cup Classic winner Flame. The cemetery is extremely popular. It's on both types of tours that we offer, so the trolley tour and the walking tour. Um, you know, people travel from all over the world to see Secretariat's grave, um, so it's really exciting to see people's reaction to seeing that. Secretariat, the 1973 Triple Crown winner. I just want to thank everybody for coming on this tour. Um, this is a tour that we've been really excited about. We're really excited to open up this side of the operation to the public. I think Claiborne is just absolutely iconic when it comes to horse racing. I don't think you can think of horse racing without thinking of Secretariat and Claiborne Farm. Back with you on our Thursday coverage, America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. It's brought to you in part by legendary Claybird Farm. 100 years of doing the usual unusually well. He is here. He's arrived. Andy Serling, New York Racing Association handicapper, here for the latter half of uh, this Thursday card <laughs> as we get set for the late pick four coming up. I've arrived and you're leaving in a few minutes. I get a segment with you or two. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but I'm only taking it slightly personally. It's great to be here. It's beautiful. It's nice to see the uh, the tarps off of the turf courses and just about nine days away from a little turf racing. It's exciting. Courses look great. It's a nice day out and just so much to look forward to. Including, there's that turf we're going to be seeing very soon. Looking good. It really is. 23 days away from that first Saturday in May as well. And this weekend, we're just a couple of days away, a day away, from one of the most prestigious races in the Distaff Division, Grade 1 Apple Blossom, $1.25 million purse. So many intriguing storylines in this one, uh, including the presence of Adair Manor for Bob Baffert, who put together a five-race win streak at one point last year that included four straight graded stakes victories. I'd like to get nine to five on her in this spot. I think that <laughs> seems like a juicy price. I think she's going to be closer to even money, and she should be. And also the recency she has gives her a real edge over her competition and intimacy, tax stretching out, and what wet paint can do. But, I mean, this filly has consistently run fast figures. She got a lifetime best figure last time out. I don't know if she can duplicate it, but she and the winner put a lot of distance between themselves and the rest of the field. It's sort of jumped into a different stratosphere, yeah. even though it was in defeat figure-wise with their five-year-old return. See what she can produce here in the second start of her five-year-old campaign, but it looks like, well, I mean, West Coast speed with Baffert probably controls. I mean, if she's not controlling, the other horse may be going too fast or maybe overmatched. She looks very hard to beat in here. And of course, the reason that she's running here as opposed to La Troyan is that Bob Baffert can't run at Churchill Downs, not to say she wouldn't come here anyway. The Apple Blossom is a, is a very historically important race, the first grade one for that division this year. And Adair Manor has every bit of a chance to be the leader of that division this year. We haven't seen last year's winner come back, Idiomatic. Not sure if she's coming back to La Troyan or not, but Adair Manor looks like the goods. And you talk about consistency too, 12 times and the majority of them wins first or second in 15 career starts meanwhile honor delady another one a four-year-old filly took a big move forward in her first start of her four-year-old campaign it was a win at golf stream in the grade three royal delta yeah now she had a perfect trip that day i do think that she ran well in here i don't want to discount her and i can respect the fact that uh, savvy joseph's going to take a shot and come here why shouldn't he it's a very important race and you're also catching i mean uh, listen i'm a fan of tax I think she's
just a neat horse, but she's going to have to improve to be able to beat these horses. And Wet Paint's another horse who has some big wins, but she's never been that fast. And maybe Honor to Lady is a horse that's just improving at the right time. Meanwhile, second, third, and fourth place finishers all coming out of the Azari. Are we ever going to get to see Shotgun Hottie kind of get back to her big performances. That's what I'm wondering. You know, can she find that good form she had last year when she went on the shelf? I mean, the Molly Pitcher, she looked like she had a chance to be a player in this division for Cherie DeVoe. If you like her, you have to be optimistic that she can step forward. Bella More, we'll, uh, we'll see if she can get it done in this race. But I got to tell you, this Azari was not a pretty picture. And these horses are going to have to run better against some more big girls showing up for this one. And how about this spot coming back for the four-year-old return for the Coaching Club American Oaks winner from last year, Wet Paint? I thought this was her best effort, the CCA Oaks. Having said that, how good was this field really? And she never really demonstrated that she could run the kind of speed figures that she needs to run. But she can improve as a four-year-old. She's got a very good trainer. She is a horse that's always going to be a bit at the mercy of the pace. And that's why a horse like Adair uh, Manor is always going to have an advantage on her because she can sort of dictate how the races are run. But Wet Paint ran well in this race. But I still think, Greg, she's going to have to take another real step forward to be a major player in this division this year. But not to say she can't. Let's not forget we learned about her because of what she did at Oaklawn on that Kentucky Oaks Trail. Undefeated, three for three at Oaklawn. Uh, different level of company, though, yeah. that she's going to be tackling this time around to try and keep that record intact and make it four for four. You'll see live coverage coming up this Saturday with our live crew on site in Hot Springs. And I always felt like the Apple Blossom was the one chance outside the Reader's Cup Classic where Zenyatta got a chance to strut her stuff on yeah. the dirt course. And her race is the Apple Blossom, obviously inferior competition, but they were extremely good efforts. I think they showed that if she could have run in the dirt her whole career, she might have even been a better horse. Yeah, that's a good point. This is the one to beat. Coming up as we start the pick four back here at Aqueduct with in view. Drop down in class for trainer Ray Handel. Dylan Davis will have them out looking for his third on this Thursday card. We'll be back. see this too often maybe never again flight line 20 lengths clear world-class racehorse world-class performance and a world championship event back with you on our fox sports 2 coverage thursday card from aqueduct and the start of the late pick four does it go through this five horse here within view for a handle? 
I think it does, and I think that Dylan Davis is supposed to show his new aggressive side and just try to go to the lead in a race that doesn't have much speed. And I, listen, I'm not going to tell you this was a superstar, but was running against much better horses last time, and I just feel like he's found the right field. I singled him in a small pick five play because I couldn't find anywhere else really to go. We'll line up against Compute It again, and Compute It, yeah, slow start from within view that day, and it was the debut. Compute It, it was his second start. Um, finish just ahead of him that afternoon. Cutting back, could you see Compute It be a factor at all? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it has at times run good races. I didn't love the recent efforts, but, you know, this horse has run some good figures. I just wonder if the early races are just the better races, and maybe he's tailed off a bit, but obviously he could win this race. I thought Ring Me had a chance to win this race. I think Big Good to Know You can win this race. I don't think the five is that good within view that nobody has a chance. I just believe this is sort of his race to win. Here's Neptune Beast. We kick off the post parade. Rudy Rodriguez trains. I mean, he's even on the fringe of being fast. Fast enough. I think he's no bargain at nine to two, though. Solo to two. ride, Jose Gomez for David Donk. Well, I mean, this horse has never been entered in a real dirt race until today. Um, does a new gelding and drops down, but is never getting indication he can run at all. Here's Compute It, one who did finish ahead of Within View in his second career start. Yeah, I didn't love his last race. Uh, it kind of bothered me a little bit, but his first couple races were good. Jose Lescano. Winning a lot of races early on this meet will be aboard Ring Me, John Terranova, Lane Luzzi. Yeah, I'm always a fan of the Terranova horses and thought this horse ran well enough to back to have a chance here and was flattered, I guess, by how good uh, Reunion ran two races back. Within view, drop in class right handle. Just don't fool around. Just go to the front. Dylan Davis again looking for number three on this card. Up to my knees in it. David Donk trains. Gets a fast track for the first time, reminding us how much rain we got this winter. Has yet to do much running, but does drop to the lowest level. And same double-digit odds, 12 to 1 outside on Bin Good to Know You, Charlie Baker. Yeah, does get back to a fast track and was coming off a long layoff last time he was on one. I Once again, I'm not... You know, I think 12 to 1 is probably a bit of an overlay on this horse. I don't. Why is the 1 taking so money to switch to Manny Franco? Non-threatening third last time out. I want to remind everyone, get the inside track on handicapping with Naira Vets track stats. 11% of dirt races, they've been won by horses with 10 to 1 odds or higher during the Aqueduct meet. You can find more stats like that and tracks across the country at NairaVets.com. So four minutes to post. Here in the race to kick off this pick four as we take a look at Ring Me, eight to one. John Terranova has had a short price favorite get beat. Earlier on the card here, we'll see if he can rebound with this horse, Lane Leslie, aboard. Yeah, I don't think John's horse ran that badly earlier. He just ran a horse that ran surprisingly well in good reunion or just sort of dominated off the claim for Michelle uh for Michelle Nevin, I think I think eight to one is a very square price on this horse. His races two and three back are good enough. He cuts back a little in distance from the mile, and to me, eight to one is a real overlay on him. Why, why is he less likely to win than the horse in the rail, who's half the price that he is, less than half the price? Yeah, Neptune Beach continuing to take a lot of money right now. The one He'll probably run well, but I don't. I don't. Do you see it? I don't see him at I three to one. That sort of second price. choice right now. Well, Mig going with the four. He can make his case for us. Yeah, I, I just like him turning back to seven eights. I, I thought the mile might have been stretching him a little bit. He seemed to flatten out uh, last time. He's by Central Banker, and he just looks so good in the flesh. I just really like what I'm seeing from a physical perspective. So at nine to one now, m maybe he's cold on the board, but I just don't think that he's a pr an appropriate price. I think he's way too big a price. Um, you know, I, I agree with Andy, the one Neptune Beach, and he, I don't think a lot separates them, and he's three to one. Uh, obviously, within view is the horse to beat. I think he looks terrific. He, you know, he's dropping back down to the maiden 30 level after trying maiden 40 first time, and he broke a step slow that day. So, yeah, he, he makes a lot of sense. He's very logical, but I, I thought the four looked terrific on the racetrack, and I, I think that he makes some sense turning back an eighth of a mile at too big a price. So He's my top selection. Uh, the seven horse up to my knees in it does have an extension blink around the outside. I don't know if this is something he's been fitted with all along. You can see in his running lines, he's had trouble. He lugged out in his first start. He checked last time. Horses like this sometimes are just very difficult to handle. I don't know that he has run with it or not in the past, um, but he's got an, ex you know, kind of a, a really severe extension blinker, which will limit his outside uh, view. And a lot of trainers believe that horses won't run to where they can't see. Having ridden horses, my, you know, pretty much my whole life, 
Mm, I don't really agree with that. I don't think the horses uh, really uh, respond to that. They, they tend to kind of run out regardless, but maybe it just gives the rider a little bit more control. You know, the MIG hasn't ridden a horse in like 10 years. He's really got to stop. That's a good point. <laughs> stop acting like an expert, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> 10 to 1, <laughs> totally. on up to my knees in it. Right. It's supposed to me. <laughs> <laughs> whose entire life is about pretending I'm an expert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it's just it's been – Richie just stopped, Oh, do we really. have a response? Because, Richie, you know, if you've been riding you. a horse recently, I'm telling your wife. <laughs> well, no, no, Andy, let's get let's get our time first, right? I haven't ridden in over 14 years now. Right. I think it was about the same – Time last time you picked a winner? Is that, no, uh, well, <laughs> for me, it's 12, Richie. That stings. <laughs> Meg still gets up on horses at his farm where he's taking uh, care of his horses. If Carmella finds out he's getting up on horses, he's going to come in here in a sling. <laughs> <laughs> Three to two favorite within view, the five. So Dylan Davis again looking for his third coming up for Ray Handel. And we'll see if this horse can turn the tables on, compute it. These kind of races, though, I'm... horses can step up and surprise you. Right. And also horses cannot show up. Yeah. I mean, these are not, you know, the, the thing about racing is that the, the better the horses are, the more reliable they are. I think it's just a, you know, you can just count on the better horses to run back their good races, and, and, or at least with some consistency. And with, with lower level horses, they're just not likely to hold their form as well. Um, so I, listen, I, I do think the five is way the horse to be as the public does, but I, I'm not gonna argue with somebody that says, this horse is not good enough for me to take six to five on him. I, I, I can understand that thinking and I have no problem with it. And I agree with Richie, I picked the four second and I think he's absolutely right that Ring Me is a real overlay in this race to me on the board he's the, the the real overlay i don't i mean listen a lot of horses win that i'm not a fan of neptune beach would be one of them and i don't understand how you look at their respective pps and think that neptune beach should be four to one and ring me could be should be a nine to one the only thing he really has an advantage is he's got manny franco but other than that i just think the four is a it's better maybe horse. just more familiarity with the connections maybe yeah it's maybe. hard to explain otherwise it's not like john terranova john Ta Ter tanya terranova don't win races yeah. i mean they're very good there is neptune beach and manny will try and see if this three-year-old can finally make an impact here i mean both those third place performances was nowhere near the vicinity of the winner slight cut back in distance going to be far back early. I think it would, it would behoove Dylan to be aggressive here. I think Richie would agree. It's the kind of horse that if Rich, when Richie rode, I always had a real confidence that he would see that he was riding the fastest horse early and win or lose, he'd send the horse the lead. And the other thing is if you're potentially riding the best horse and can be in front, you're supposed to take advantage of that situation. I think one of the reasons Dylan's doing as well as he is, is he's doing that more and more. This race will be very interesting to see who takes command early because no one really has much pace Agreed. in this race. We'll see how it plays out. Let's go upstairs. Chris Griffin to start off this pick four. Good to know you. Last to load. Been good to know you. Hesitates, touch reluctant, now moves forward again. And in. All set. And they're off. Good speed from Bitten. Good to know you to the outside, right there with up to my knees in it in the early mix with Ring Me in between horses now to assume command. It's Ring Me with a four-way battle for the front. Is trying to join them as solo ride tightly at the rail as Neptune Beach. Didn't want to be behind the leading group. Is going to hold that rail position. Now takes fourth. Solo ride is back to fifth. Then comes Compute It towards the tail end with the trailer within view. They start to sort themselves out and up to my knees and it's got the lead. Went 23 seconds flat for the opening quarter mile. Ring Me, who broke with those leaders, is now back to the third. Third spot is a challenge third with Ben Good to Know who moves up alongside as they approach four furlongs left to go. Another three lengths back here, Neptune Beach trying to cut into the margin at the rail there, solo ride. From the back within view starts to launch a rally, Purple Cap and the trailer 
is computed. Well into the far turn now, up to my knees in it, has been confronted and now passed by Been Good to Know Ya to the outside. Been Good to Know Ya and Isaac Castillo, they've taken the lead. They're up by a quick length and a half as they approach a quarter mile left to go. Been Good to Know Ya, trying to fend them off. Here comes Ring Me and Lane Leslie moving towards the outside. Ring Me with every shot down the center of the racetrack to catch the leader. Been Good to Know Ya from far out of it within view, trying to close with Neptune Beach, but too much ground to make up as Been Good to Know Ya opens back up again is now up by three, four widening lengths with a 16th left to go. It's all been good to know ya at 7-1. Been good to know ya. Wins it easily. Ring me held second, then came a photo within view to the outside of a solo ride in one minute, 24.59 seconds. Been good to know ya. Had been you know, com competitive against better in the past. The last couple of races, though, did not inspire a ton of confidence. But I guess the way to look at it, and we talked about this beforehand, is he was coming off a year-plus layoff, two back. Then he caught a sloppy seal track, and today he got a very forward trip by Isaac Castillo. I don't know if something went wrong with the five. I, I didn't see really the head on at the start, but I don't know how you end up back at last with, within view early. And while he had his chance to get second, didn't run particularly well, I don't know how you could expect to win from back there. And, you know, being forward really helped. No excuse for Ring Me. He got a very good ride. He was forward. He got a good trip. He was simply second best. As it turned out, the winner was much the best. I'm not saying that within view ran well. I just don't understand what happened that he was last early. And maybe the head on tells a different story. Here it is. We're looking at another camera. 7 to 1 on your winner. No, I mean, the four came out a little, but I mean, Dylan did ask him a little bit, to be fair, but he, I mean, I don't know how that horse could be last early. 8, 4, 5, 2. And another upset here. Had an upset to start off the pick six. 7 to 1 shot, beating a 6 to 5 favorite here in the first leg of the pick four. We're going to take a timeout. We'll have the prices for you. Been good to know you. Charlie Baker Barn, Isaac Castillo here in the fifth. to coverage brought to you in part where you can play it all. Naira bets, bet any track, anywhere, anytime. It is busy there today. It is, and people are really, I mean, they say New York's a fast town. <laughs> Feels like you're moving that fast sometimes here. Uh, been good to know you. 
moving faster than anybody else in this field to get that maiden victory. Seventh time out. The win, $17.60 for the victory. Let's go to Mig. Thanks, Greg. And a very welcome addition to this jockey colony, Isaac Castillo. You've had a really nice winter here, Isaac. And this particular trip, get in forward position, really kind of set up your trip, didn't it? Yes, uh, the, the position um, outside have a lot of horse. Uh, he's uh, really good over there for me. And when the Husky, he he going to be there. It's the first time you ever rode this horse. How do you prepare when you have never ridden a horse before? Um, I warm my rope him, and I feel like he, he can have a talent. Uh, and thank you, the trainer and the owner, for giving me the opportunity. And, uh, I was talking with your agent, uh, Billy Castle, and he was telling me that you're going to split your time up a little bit, though. Mammoth and here, you'll be going back and forth. Uh, yes, I tend to uh, keep in New York and, and, and here, and tend to, I love it here, no? Um, I love New Jersey, too, and tend to do back and forth. Yeah. Well, you've done it awfully well going back and forth to Oakland this winter. A lot of traveling. Yeah, um, yeah it's a lot of travel, but like, when you win, everything is like getting really nice and all the opportunity you get for different trainers and different owners. Um, I'm grateful. Well, Isaac, it's great to have you here. Really a terrific young rider. And it's always easier to travel when you're winning. It doesn't seem like those plane rides are as long. Yeah, it's got to be a lot more relaxing taking those plane rides back after after heading out of town and getting a victory. <laughs> Isaac Castillo, fairly new to this circuit, and we've been saying his name quite a bit. And, I, I, you know, he comes in here, and, and a lot of his business was going to be based on riding for David Jacobson. But in this case, it shows he's getting other opportunities and making the most of them, and that's the most important thing. I don't care who you're riding for one person. They're not going to make your career. You've got to get other opportunities, and he's making the most of it. Now things are going to get tougher, obviously. Even Ramon Vasquez is coming in. I believe they'll have the same agent, actually. But all the other riders eventually coming back after the Derby. But I think he's shown a lot of people that he belongs at a high level in this game at somewhere, whether he ends up riding well here all year or spending more of his time here in the winter. He's a good rider. Let's move on to a race that we talked about at the top of the show. Race six, six furlongs. Three-year-old fillies, starter optional claiming group. And we had mentioned snapping buttons, that poor beginning in the debut when she was sent off favorite and then just dominated a group. Did, but dominated a group that was a lot easier to dominate than the one that she's facing today. And she better get out of the gate today because I don't think she wants to spot these. This, I thought, was a super, super competitive race. One of the things you have to ask yourself is, how confident are you that Don't Listen can run the same kind of race that she ran before the layoff because she ran very well? How do you feel about controlled temper coming in from out of town? This is one of the more fascinating races on the card. A controlled temper at outside post, probably the only one without speed in this group. There's a lot of pace. Who's going to get to the front? We'll talk more about that. You're leaving. When I leave, because I'm out of here. Acacia Clement going to step in for Thank me. God. <laughs> Sorry, I do endure it. <laughs> It wasn't easy. <laughs> uh, we're going to take a timeout. I'll see everyone tomorrow. I'll be back. But uh, again, in case you're stepping in for me, Linda Rice, what a role she is on this meet on a tear. After setting a record last year, equaling the most wins ever on the Naira circuit. I'm going to see a lot more Linda Rice coming up. We roll along after this. Volatil in front as they pass the 16th pole. Volatil victorious in the Vanderbilt. One by two lengths. Tremendous amount of talent with his win in the Vanderbilt, as well as a couple of his wins at Churchill Downs. Ran unbelievably fast. Uh, you know, very special family to me. Perfect star for two-year-old sales. Just a gorgeous horse and throwing very athletic horses that I think will run. Victorious.
Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. When I go to the barn in the morning and train horses that I'm excited about running, that's what drives me. Winning races, whether it be a claiming race or a stakes race or a grade one at Saratoga, it's so much more fun than losing. Okay guys, Jose, I'm ready for uh, the first one. Go ahead, we're going from the half out five eights. My father, he was a hard worker and uh, he was very ambitious, uh, instilled a strong work ethic in my three brothers and myself, and he had a love for the horses uh, his whole life, and he instilled that in us as well. It's double booked in front. My first good horse was a horse named Double Booked, a grass horse, when I started training at Monmouth Park, an affiliate of my father's named Ready Jack Go. But I would say that City Zip was a very good two-year-old. Uh, I brought him here. He won all three two-year-old stakes here. It's City Zip in front of the 16th. City Zip by three. He would be the horse that really helped move me along the path that I am on now. Who's going to win? A Belma. I like to claim a lot of young horses with um, lightly raised horses that I think have both potential on their pedigree side and, of course, confirmation. So that's been a big asset to my claiming, which has been probably in the last five years I've been doing more of. Voodoo Song digs in. Is he going to do it? He is! Voodoo Song with a four-star Dave! New York racing is, um, frankly, it's my home. I've been here for quite a few years. I have gone from a young trainer that was struggling to climb the ladder to being a, a mainstay in New York. And I think by not diluting my business at different venues, I think it's been helpful for me to be successful right here in New York. I'm all about New York racing. My father always said, well, he didn't want to die in a harness. And uh, I think about that sometimes. but. I don't know what my day would be like if I didn't have horses to train or to be around or to be excited about. Linda Rice. I'd like them to say she was one hell of a horse trainer and uh, she earned it. And Linda Rice has certainly shown that with just the amazing success that she's had on the racetrack and has continued to have as I'm Acacia Kamau stepping in for Greg Wolf here with Andy Serling for the rest of the card. And Andy, you know when they uh, change any claiming rules? You're doing something right. <laughs> right. When they, when they change the rules um, because of you, and they did in Kentucky because of Linda, then you are doing something right. And it's hard. I mean, you look at this game and you look at life. There aren't that many people you can say that have changed rules or made different. You think about, I mean, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, they outlawed the dunk when he was in college. Mm -hmm. And you think about, and That's for, a very for good me in comparison. this game, Wesley Ward is one of the few people in yeah. the last 20 years that has significantly changed in this game. But I think he changed the way European trainers train their young horses mm -hmm. for those sprint races by going over there and showing them up and showing what you could do by getting your horse to be trained for speed. And I think Alinda has changed certain things. She certainly changed the way they looked at the claiming rules in yep. Kentucky. And this is in life. Women are easily as important than men. I'm going to say they're more important than men in many cases, in most cases. But in this game, they're a huge, huge part of the game, but unfortunately they don't get to be in the spotlight that often. And Linda has really changed that in a very, very positive way. And, and it's good to see them get the credit on the front line that they, they don't get enough. Couldn't agree more as it's been a tremendous last year for female trainers in particular with the big successes that they've had on the racetrack. But speaking about the Triple Crown, it's on everybody's mind nowadays as we get closer and closer to the Kentucky Derby. Here is a look at the Kentucky Derby leaderboard presented by Spendthrift and Sierra Leone with that win in the bluegrass. Andy going up to number one. Now it's interesting looking at him in fierceness because they're, they're pretty much as opposite 
opposite as horses could be. Sierra Leone bad loading into the gate before the bluegrass last early and then just flying with that incredible turn of foot that he has. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've talked to Chad around a bit this week, but we haven't ever. <laughs> Sierra Leone has not even come up. Uh, but I, I think it is a question he's going to find himself answering more than he wants to. How concerned he is about loading with the bigger crowd being expected. Not that it was a it was empty at Keeneland. They had a big crowd as well in a smaller place. But the fact that he delivered after acting yeah. like that is very, very important. And it was a race where he was the only one that closed. Now he may have been the only really competent closer in the race. So I don't think it's that surprising. And it was not his pace to run at, but he figures to get one in the Derby. I'm surprised that a lot of people right now think he and Fierceness are going to be similar prices because he lacks the brilliance of Fierceness. What he doesn't lack, he has that consistency. He always seems to show up. But Fierceness has a brilliance that Sierra Leone does not have, and I just thought he'd be favored. And I do think that Fierceness is the likeliest winner, even though I'm probably going to find myself playing against him. The thing with Fierceness, and he was dazzling in the Florida Derby. I think that, that's really kind of the word for it. He has shown that when faced with adversity, he does not overcome it. And that is something that we ha have seen Sierra Leone be able to do. But if Fierceness gets the lead, like he did in the Florida Derby, I mean, he just made a mockery of the field. But the start in the Derby can be difficult Absolutely. for the best of horses and a lot of randomness. And there are plenty of speed horses being signed on for this race. And there is a dichotomy to his races. They have been terrific yep. or they've been awful. And it's fair, and I'm sure the connections are worried that if something goes wrong early, he's going to throw the towel in. But when, and it's not that he needs the lead. He stalked General Partner, who's sure. a talented horse in the Breeders' Cup, but he had that comfortable stalking position. If he gets things to go well for him, he has a brilliance that nobody in this field has shown. The two-year-old champion, he was dominant in the Breeders' Cup, taking the Breeders' Cup at Juvenile, and now has kind of proved himself as a three-year-old. We saw that performance in the Florida Derby that we were waiting to see. Sierra Leone, the always well thought of a horse that kind of got a little bit of a later start, but has been brilliant on the racetrack. I actually ran into his owner, Peter Brandt, in the city the other day, which is unusual, and obviously <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's, he's very excited. I mean, Peter's had a lot of great horses over the years, but this is a chance to win a Kentucky Derby, which is a, a very, very big deal. And I think Tyler Gaffleone has ridden him extremely well. He has yeah. gotten good position. He's had confidence in him. But it's not always easy to ride horses like that. Deeper closers, you have to time your move well. And I thought he's ridden this horse to absolute perfection. Has done a very good job. We'll see what he can do in the Kentucky Derby with 19 other horses to worry about and the traffic that he Right. Might the trips don't necessarily make themselves yep. in the Kentucky Derby. But I think the Tyler has done a very good good job making the trips for Sierra Leone, and Sierra Leone has obviously delivered. A couple of pretty talented horses moving on to the Kentucky Derby. We move on to race six at Aqueduct today. Six furlongs on the main track for three-year-old fillies. Here's a look at the field controlled temper. Very short price of the outside. How is anybody, he's Ooh. now even money, but how is anybody <laughs> that short a price in this race? I think he's a tremendous underlay. For more in the rest of this field, as we have a little bit of rain falling, let's head down and get a paddock report from Richard McLeory. Yeah, Keisha, I'm, I'm hiding out here underneath the uh, overhang. Uh, it's uh, kind of already stopped. It just came through kind of quickly, and now it's just a little bit of a drizzle. The two-horse Don't Listen was a horse I was very interested on paper because this horse did run a 70 buyer figure as a two-year-old, and you always expect these horses to have a little bit, you know, more in the tank as they mature that, that you know, you could see improvement. You always look at horses coming off a layoff, and you know, how do they look fitness-wise? She's a light filly. She's you know, kind of a tall, you know, thinner type. She looks very fit to me. I, I will have no problem with her from a fitness standpoint. Uh, Jorge Duarte, a good rider when he rode, wound up assistant to uh, Al Goldberg before taking over as full-time trainer for Colts Next Stable. I uh, actually had the bug here and rode very well. She looks fit. She looks ready to go, and you would have to expect improvement from two to three. The five horse, your forever, really checks the boxes from a physical perspective. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to line up with what we see on their paper, on their form, and what we see physically. I wish I saw was as happy with her form on paper as I am the way she looks from a physical perspective. Looks outstanding, number five, your forever. The six snapping buttons, impressive debut win after breaking slowly. Um, you know, looks great. Looks like the race 
race didn't affect her in a negative way. Sometimes you look at second time starters and you're waiting to see if, you know, maybe the first race shook them up. I'm not seeing any of that at all. And usually horses improve with a start as far as their gait habits. They usually break better the second time. And the seven horse controlled temper. This uh, filly shipping in from fairgrounds, she came into the paddock on fire. She was a handful all the way around. Once she got the tack on and they added her blinkers, she actually settled down a great deal, which I take as a big sign, kind of that, you know, energy first, a little bit nervous. And it looks like she's kind of really settled into it now, knowing that her, you know, almost time to go ahead and do her job, making a nicer impression now. Although still on her toes, they got the pony in front of her, guys. So we'll keep an eye on her as we head out to the racetrack. All right, Richie, thank you. We'll see what she does now. Even money, controlled temper to the outside. As this is a tricky race, Andy. You've got some last out maiden winners. You've got some big layoff horses as well. There's a lot of guesswork in this spot. This is a horse controlled temper that broke her maiden in a $15,000 maiden claimer at Fairgrounds. And Joe Sharp's a trainer that wins a lot of races. But as you can see, off the claim with dirt sprinters, his numbers are nothing exciting to speak of. And this is her win two races back. Well, she dominated dominated a field. Mm -hmm. But even the effort there, a 66 buyer, why why does that make her a substantial favorite here? I'm I am perplexed as to why this horse is an overwhelming favorite. My guess is that she is not this kind of favorite in multi-race bets. Do you think that maybe it's a little bit of the recency thing that the fact that she just finished second in March, whereas you have, you know, status seeker that hasn't run since June, don't listen that hasn't run since November. Mm -hmm. I think that's, those are, those are very valid points. Um, but why is she supposed to be that big a favorite over Snap and Buttons who sure. did win here? Now, based on the multi-race bets, they're going to be much closer mm -hmm. by post time, probably in the, you know, eight to five to five to two or two to one range. But I think that, that don't listen. I don't know where don't listen. The two's last race came from because it's aberrationally yep. high from a speed figure standpoint. I don't care what numbers you look at last time out, but if she's able to even duplicate that performance, she might be the horse to beat. And my feeling with status seeker is she'll be a square price. And I don't care that she ran a 48 buyer debuting in the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. That's as early as early we run too. That may have been one of our first, yeah. if not first two year old races. And that number could easily become a 65 to 70 in here off of the layoff. And I thought she ran five that day. I'm not in love with her, but I thought that she'd be a square enough price where it's not like anybody in here has run that well. I mean, the only horse that might take some money, though she is the big price I expected her to be, was the one grab the glory. I don't think she's even remotely competitive here. But among the two, six and seven, I think the three has a chance to belong with them and she'll be the best price of them. There's a look at the number six to, towards the outside snap and buttons, who, as you mentioned, does have the recency as well. She's only had one start. She just absolutely dominated a maiden 40 uh, field against New York breads last time out. Just always in control, though she did not break well. No, she didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And yes, it means she ran a little better than it looks, mm -hmm. but... You never want a horse that doesn't get out of the gate. Now, on the other hand, we've been around the racetrack a long time. A lot of horses that don't break in their first starts are, are fine going forward than that. Case in point, deterministic. A horse didn't break well first time, and while he didn't run well on Saturday, he has broken well in yep. his subsequent races. Sometimes first-time stars are just a little confused coming out of the gate. But still, it's something to note, and this is a much tougher field than she faced last time out and she was cranked up to win first time but I still don't think she's supposed to be a bigger price than the number seven horse at least she did it in New York I think the seven is yeah. massively overbet maybe she's working very well and there's some kind of story on her I see she has that work at March 10th at fairgrounds mm -hmm. but you know she shows a very slow work here but it just feels like there has to be a story for her to be this short something. price <laughs> something um, there is the number two though don't listen I, I thought she was going to take a lot more money than the five to one right now because like you said that last race was impressive with the 70 buyer speed figure now she has the layoff to contend with here the big question for me is can she repeat it absolutely and the trainer does not have great numbers off layoffs but like the second place finisher got a 66 she came back to run a 65 buyer and then a 71 buyer now the third horse was a distant third isn't very good but the second horse made that this race look legitimate i don't have any reason you see the gaps to disbelieve the number now i think it's fair to say where to come from based on the first two races and how reliable is she to run that race coming back but you know depending on her everything depends on price occasion right yep seven to one on grab the glory if you are interested her half brother amundsen won race two
Well, Bridgeham was a really nice horse. Richie probably yeah. rode the dam at some point probably. in his career. Um, I just think she'd be a terrible field first last time out. There is. Don't listen. First start since November. Yeah, I think a very fair price right now at 7-2. to two. Status seeker off the layoff. I was hoping to get a little bit of a better price. I'm hoping this one can improve for Rudy. Just her second start. We saw her as an early two-year-old. There is the other Rudy Rodriguez horse, six-pack Senorita. Yeah, she won a sloppy track, seal track last time. She just doesn't look good enough unless she takes a big step forward. Another last out winner. Here's your forever. Ditto on her, and she's even slower. Brooker Maiden in her third start. She's the biggest price on the board right now at 15 to 1. There is Snap and Buttons second time out. Right now on the board, this horse is saying, no, thank you. Surprised she's Nine right now, she's fourth two choice right now after but breaking her maiden by six and a half lengths. And there is control temper, looks like <laughs> she's trying to control that temper out there. She is drifting up in price, so she's becoming at least a little bit more realistic at this point. If you're looking to play better. That's the field control temper still nine to five right now on the board. This is the field for race number six. You can earn a $20 bonus today by playing with Naira Betts. Bet at least $100 each at Aqueduct and Keeneland today, and you could earn a $20 bonus. Win or lose, all you have to do is opt in at NairaBets.com. About four minutes away from race number six, the number seven control temper, as Richie had touched on, accompanied by the pony back in the paddock. And I guess this is why taking her a few a few steps to get acclimated, get settled out on the racetrack, and she is drifting up in price now. She's claimed out of a $15,000 maiden claiming race. Then she's claimed out of a $30,000 race. Now she's running for 50. Now, I understand these are age-restricted three-year-old races, and her last race was three-year-olds and up. But still, I, I just... I don't understand the major appeal of her. I, like I said, I consider one of the contestant contenders. I picked the race three, two, seven, six, but I don't believe that she is a, a, a strong favorite in here. For more on the field as the horses warm up, let's go back to Richie. Yeah, guys, not a lot changed from my first impressions in the paddock. Uh, the two don't listen was a horse that I was interested in when I was, you know, handicapping the races last night, and then liked what I saw from her in the paddock from a fitness standpoint. Made a nice impression warming up as well. And, you know, you'd have to think she'd improve from two to three, just a natural order of things. So I think she's very interesting. The six snapping buttons will be my top selection. I, I was impressed with her first start. Um, yeah, you know, she, she did what she had to do and maybe beat the right kind of field. But she broke slow. I think if she breaks cleaner today, she can set up an even better trip. And I like the fact that she seemed unperturbed by her first start. And that's something that's very important to look at when you're watching horses that were impressive on debut. How did that first race affect them from a mental standpoint? Did it rattle their cage, shake them up? She just seemed as comfortable and settled in as you could like, and she'll be my top selection. The seven controlled temper. Uh, she was, like I said, a handful uh, in the paddock getting saddled. Seemed like she settled in nicely, and I like how focused she got after that. She just seemed to settle down more once she had the tack on and continued once she had uh, Dylan Davis aboard. Gets kind of a, a nice post position for her, kind of break, see what's going on inside of her. Dylan won't have to make any quick decisions the first eighth of a mile. All right, Richie, thank you. We'll see what Dylan does from that outside post. And Andy, we've talked about this, but I think it's worth repeating because we've seen Dylan, who rode really well throughout the winter, won the winter meet here at Aqueduct, and has kept that momentum going in large part by being aggressive and decisive early in the race. And, and I think every rider... And realizes that things are about to start getting much tougher. Yeah. And they're going to have to continue to ride the tough of their game to hold on to mounts. I mean, Dylan has been riding more for Chad mm -hmm. Brown. Well, that's going to change yep. when, when, when Irad and, and Flavian Pratt are there. And he understands that, but you still want to be in a position and ride as well as you can. And for instance, I thought that his ride on Sheeta Beauty yeah. uh, in the distaff was an absolutely sensational ride. There's no rider in the game that could have ridden that horse better mm -hmm. than Dylan Roeder. And I think a lot of her victory really was because of Dylan's ride. He did everything perfectly. It was a real thinking man's rider. And I think that ride, and that's the difference between the Dylan we're seeing now and a Dylan we saw a couple of years ago, maybe even sooner, and I think Richie would agree as well, um, those are the kind of rides he's going to have to give because it's just going to get tougher and tougher, but Dylan can hold his own. It's not as though he doesn't win races when the big big guns come back to town. Certainly does. As He's on the 2-1 to one favorite right now, the one grab the glory for Linda Rice. Uh, broke her maiden last time out, her first start in a maiden claiming level, and that was the seven-length score. Now, the question is, Andy, 
how does she stack up against this group? And you had mentioned you thought at a price she could be an interesting outlier. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... To me, I'm going to be surprised if anybody wins this race are the four choices, the two, three, six, and seven. I think that the one is a horse that is an underlay at six to one. I'm going to be honest with you. I think the one should be double-digit odds in this race. I don't think her last race gives her a sniff in this race. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's anybody among this group that's a particularly inviting price. I guess right now, maybe don't listen is a decent price. Mm -hmm. seven to do. Frankly, my horse at four to one, I don't think that's a particularly inviting price on, on Status Seeker. Yeah. Status Seeker, who we did see win first time out, not the quickest out of the gate. Again, that was back in June. It was one of the first two-year-old races that we'd see at Belmont. There's so much change that could happen in a horse from then to now. Obviously concerned we haven't seen her since then. And the other thing is, and this could be related, we talk about this. Rudy gets his two-year-olds yep. cranked up for those early races he because he, he's very smart. He sees an opportunity. Those races have good purses, and they're often not particularly tough. Mm -hmm. And so Rudy's getting horses cranked up and ready to go. They may not ultimately end up being that good, but he gets them ready to roll the first time out. He's very good in those races and sometimes at solid prices, whether winning or running second. A smart move to take advantage of those early two-year-old races with horses particularly precocious. His favoritism has now actually shifted over to snapping buttons, five to two. There she is going in for race six, six furlongs as we send it up to Chris Griffin for the call. Controlled Temper is in. All set. And they're off. Grab the glory. Flashes early speed. And there's don't listen. Hard scent in between horses. They line up. Five, six across the racetrack now. Here come joining them is going to be six pack Senorita. Out wider there. Purple cap. That's snapping buttons. The one taken back. You're forever. Doesn't want to be with the early heat. Out very wide is going to be controlled. Temper is about six wide up the back stretch at the rail saving ground. That is going to be status seeker as they've got four furlongs left to travel. They sort themselves out and they went fast. 22 and one for the opening quarter mile. Grab the glory and don't listen. Right there. One, two, just off of them. Snap and buttons. Nowhere to go yet. Status Seeker Ruiz looking for a seam. Is just waiting for room here to the outside of that one. Six-pack Senorita. Controlled Temper is making up some ground. Here comes the two-path here for Status Seeker, who's now in the clear. Is dropping back quickly. Was grabbed the glory. They reach the top of the stretch. Don't listen. Trying to hold them off. Snapping buttons to the outside. Controlled Temper has got some momentum and at the rail. Status Seeker trying to muscle on through. But snapping buttons and Manny Franco, they've taken the lead. Status Seeker, six pack senior Rita, control temper, grandstand side. It is now snapping buttons inside the final 16th, but controlled temper, even wide controlled temper is now in front. Snapping buttons tries to come back. Controlled temper gets the win. Controlled temper over snapping buttons. Don't listen. Came back and got third in one minute, 11 seconds flat. Control temper with the win. First off the claim for Joe Sharp. She took all that early money and turns out it was warranted, Andy. Yeah, and they had the right two horses with a seven and six running well. I think that Snap and Buttons had already ran very well in defeat. This was a quick early pace. 22 and one is fast. And even Don't Listen ran extremely well, yep. finishing third off the layoff given that pace. But a very good clean outside trip for Controlled Temper gets it done narrowly over the six. Status Seeker didn't break as sharply and I, I don't blame the rider. I think he tried to come inside. She wasn't comfortable going inside. I think it sort of muted her closing kick. Whether or not she's good enough though is another story completely. She may just not have been good enough. Let's go down to Richie. Yeah, guys, I just think it's important to note that Snapping Buttons was trying to lug in pretty steadily and, and severely under Manny Franco, and he had kept having a corrector because he had Don't Listen just inside of him, and he couldn't just drop her head and full out ride her because he would have bothered the two Don't Listen. If she had been a little bit easier to handle, she might have been able to hold off that uh, late rally from controlled temper, but very logical result. I think all three of the, the first three Phillies ran extremely well. Well said, Richie, and a good note on snap and buttons. You could see Manny Franco, the way he was holding the reins and the way that he was having to use his balance to try and keep his horse straight. Probably when the, the margin of victory is that slim, Andy, that's something that really can inhibit him from using the full momentum going forward. No, I think that's very, very fair, obviously. And you can see right there, and the six sort of lugging in a little bit. Just a more professional, clean run on the outside. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at it again 
who ran the best race in here. In this case, the seven got it done. We talked about it beforehand. There were three horse fours so they could win. They ran one, two, three, four, and it was relatively close. And the board, the odds board reflected it, to be honest. Another win for Dylan Davis, seven, six, two, three. Three wins on the day for Davis. We'll bring you prices and more when we come back. Stay with us on America's Day at the Races. We're back on America's Day at the races as Dylan Davis makes his way to the winner's circle for the third time today on this Thursday program at Aqueduct, this time with the number seven controlled temper in race six. Six dollar and sixty cent winner is Dylan standing by with Richie. Thanks, Acacia. Yeah, Dylan, you coming off a terrific winter meeting, leading rider, second time you've been able to do that. Uh, and you kind of did it in dramatic fashion because you were heading to Dubai, you won four races, and that afternoon kind of secured the, the title for you. Definitely did, Rich. Uh, we were debating on leaving early to make sure that we were going to get there on time and everything. We took a chance and, uh, you know, maybe the flight would have canceled, but uh, we had the title to fight for, and I stayed that extra day that Thursday and won and won four, and uh, that really put a tough position for Kendrick to try to chase me down. I put, I put me five in front, and he had two full days to catch me, and I felt pretty good then, but you never know what's possible, but uh, great competition in there, and uh, just happy to come out on top. And made it to Dubai, plenty of time to ride Panda Gate. What was that experience like? And, and how satisfying is it to get an opportunity on a, an international stage like that? No, it, it means a lot. You, you work your whole life, your whole career on, on getting to stages like that. And for a trainer outfit team to uh, uh, trust my riding skills to uh, go all the way over there and, and, and ride their horses, it means a lot to me and it's special. And uh, the horse ran great and I had a great trip and everything like that. So hopefully we can continue on with, with trips like that and, uh, and keep moving up the ladder. Well, and you've continued the momentum to the start of the spring meet here. Obviously, we're not changing venues or, you know, not from the inner track to the main track like we used to. But to me, the biggest change in you has been how consistent you've become. Uh, and, and maybe talk a little bit about that. How is it just is it natural maturing? Because it seems like now you're riding consistently good races. Yeah, I think it's a, a little bit of both, you know, just getting experience and, and getting around that track. And it took me a while to really get uh, uh, comfortable and um, confident. I think that's a big word. Uh, just because when you first come to New York, you're riding with uh, well-established riders and you might get a little nervous and stuff. So being like you could surely get the job done and 
and start beating these guys uh, in match in match duels down the lane. It feels good, and then you build your confidence as you go. And you know, now now I'm here and I'm I'm riding well, and I'm very happy with the way I'm riding, and and uh, I'm looking for more to come. Riding extremely well, and guys, for all athletes, confidence is key. Couldn't agree, agree more, Richie. And you can see that Dylan Davis's confidence is sky high right now as he heads back to the jocks room. Third win today and uh, certainly making the most of every opportunity here. And I think Dil it's obvious that Dylan's always had the skills of, of, of a top rider. But I believe in watching him ride, the biggest difference in, in how he rides and the success he's having is he's becoming a much more thoughtful rider. You can see the rides he's given. He's thinking a lot more about them and not just reacting. And, and I think that's being shown in how well he's doing because he has the skills of the rider. He's a very talented, natural rider, as all the Davises are, mm -hmm. but he's really becoming more thoughtful and I think thinking the races through a lot more. We'll take a look at the pick five follow along as we had a pretty formful race there in the six with some big prices earlier, including been good to know you, $17.60 winner with the upset. Uh, so good luck if you're still alive. Two legs to go for the late pick five as we turn our attention on to the seventh now, a mile on the main track in this starter allowance for Phillies and Mayors, three-year-olds and upward three to two favorite currently on the four Smoking hot kitty, Andy, who won last time out, yes, impressively, and she'll step up from that non-winners of three condition. But this is something that, that Greg and I will talk a lot about in the show, and it, the one number horses, mm -hmm. and while she's run okay on the turf before, her last race is a completely aberrant effort on her yeah. other dirt races, and if she runs back to it, she's a very, very likely winner of this race, but you have to ask yourself what kind of short price do you want to take that she does run back to it. And if she doesn't, she becomes just another player in this race. I picked her second. I consider the one to be taking a little bit of a shot with Bella Principessa getting back on a dry track. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that a lot of focus is on the Kentucky Derby coming up in just a few weeks. But before you know it, it will be our turn here in New York. And what a special year it will be. The Belmont Stakes this year to take place at Saratoga with construction of Belmont Park underway. And Andy, uh, I, I know that the Belmont Stakes is such a historic and special week, especially here in New York. It will take place June 6th to 9th. But Given the circumstances of what we have with the construction, it's so exciting that we have the opportunity to see Belmont Week in all its glory up at a place like Saratoga. No question about it. This is a very, very exciting time for us. I mean, with the rebuild at Belmont Park, yeah. being able to move into the, the 21st century and move forward in a very positive way for racing in New York. But we're obviously not going to be able to run there for a couple of years, and we can't have the breeders, the, the Belmont Stakes at Aqueduct. It's just simply, we don't have that much of the building. We wouldn't be able to get enough people. It would be a disaster. But to be able to go to Saratoga and have that sort of special weekend there and the, the reaction of the fans has been incredible. I, I mean, this is, to me, this the project of tearing down Belmont, I think is going to be a lot harder than rebuilding it. So. Um, it's such a massive, massive structure. And, and listen, I go back a long way, 50 years at Belmont Park, and I love Belmont. But the Belmont of, of the old days, it just doesn't really exist anymore. We spent a lot of times, a lot of very empty days there. And to see the exciting drawings and what it's going to be like getting this new building, it, it's a really, really exciting time for us. But we're also going to take a little pain because it's yes. we're going to miss <laughs> being at Belmont. And, and we love Belmont, but uh, fortunately, we have Aqueduct now to run here for the majority of the time and then Saratoga. It's bittersweet and don't be uh, don't be worried if you didn't see the white pine in the paddock there. It is being preserved where it currently is. It'll be kind of where the backyard is now with the new construction. So we're going to do everything we can to keep right. that. You know, my my family for anybody that's familiar with my my parents' house or my mom's house up in Saratoga, we built the house around a tree. We had a beautiful <laughs> tree and we didn't want to cut it down building the house. That's amazing. So we built it around it and we've had to enlarge the hole it's in in the deck wow. about five or six times in the the last 50 years. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I love that. It's built around the tree. We didn't want to tear it down, cut it down either. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, don't worry. There'll be a special preserved area for the white pine at Belmont Park as well. How many champions have walked beneath that tree many. over the years? Many, many. I bet many losers that have walked under that tree as well. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that too. It takes all kinds in the sport of horse racing. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the Oakland Stakes coming up this weekend. A Skelly looks for back-to-back -back victories in the county. Fleet. We'll discuss his chances in the rest of the field after this on America's State the Races. It's a domineering display by the ultra talented McKinsey. McKinsey in a dominant performance. <laughs> 
200, right there, 1,200,000. million, 200,000. 25, 550, Mitchell, 550,000. Now 500, and 500,000, thank you. 450, 475, 475,000. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing. Be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Eclipse champion Blame, standing at Claiborne Farm. As they move through the stretch, it's still Skelly. Skelly maintains a daylight lead. And then comes Strobe. Pirate Rick toward the inside. Surveillance making up some ground. And Tejano twist on the far outside. But it's going to be Skelly. Skelly takes the count fleet start to finish. Skelly in last year's Count Fleet. He's looking to defend his title this year in 2024 for Steve Asmussen. It'll be his first race back stateside after running a valiant second in the dirt sprint on Saturday Cup night. Seven weeks, exactly. I guess that's the question because he is the best horse in the race. And there's no question he is the horse to beat. But I do think you have to be a little concerned yeah. that he'll be able to come back this quickly in this kind of spot. It'll be interesting to see with Skelly because he, he, he went on the shelf last year before mid-year. He has a chance to be a leading sprinter in the country right now. This is a division that is, there's a dearth uh, of good horses in the sprint division. You you've look got post at the, time, you've got a couple that are kind of knocking on the door about getting to that next level with the retirement of the leaders of the division. Yeah, well, absolutely. And you look at last year's, it's not like there are some three-year-olds from last year. You're saying, oh, I can't wait for this one to run or that one. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of room at the top. And it's interesting, it just, the, the opportunities and the money isn't really there, I guess, in the sprint division. So you see people always wanting to be in the longer races, and I understand that. But there have to be some sprinters out there lurking around that people may not even know. And I think one of the mistakes that, in my opinion, connections make often is they worry that six furlongs is too short. I never think it's really so much about distance because if you have a closer, six furlongs is even better because the paces will be faster than seven. What's the only race that Elite Power lost? Yeah. The forego when the pace was against him that day. They'll be faster at six and Elite Power at closer, but he was incredibly efficient at six furlongs. So I really wish that more people would take shots. One of the reasons I'm glad to see that Timberlake, for instance, mm -hmm. that Brad Cox yeah. was so quick to say, we're not pushing towards the Derby. We're going to turn him back because he might be a very, very good sprinter. And Steve Asmussen has had a lot of success with finding good sprinters yeah. as well. And uh, you saw Jackie's Warrior on that list of past winners at the Count Fleet. And uh, I'm sure he's thinking too. He's looking at the division and obviously the success that he's had. And Gunite, one of the leaders that he had retired, thinking maybe Skelly's a horse that could take that jump. Absolutely. I, I don't I, I, I have to think he's one of the ones yeah. that could be a major player in this division. I was thinking about it a little bit with that Philly that we love, Alva Starr, and yeah. I, I, I feel like I'm gonna be champion of her club. There is no <laughs> grade one for three for, for older Phillies and mares on the dirt at six furlongs. Her connection seven, should right? be thinking yeah. right, should be thinking about the Vanderbilt. Plus, it works perfectly to go there from the to, to the ballerina. Mm -hmm. Phillies have done very well against the boys in sprints over the years. 
Then you have to the outside, we're taking a look. Oh, well, first we're taking a look at the Riyadh Dirt Sprint where Skelly did finish second behind Remake. Remake and Bold Journey both ran in Dubai um, after that. And Skelly, again, making his first race back and using that speed, finishing second that day. Listen, he's a good horse, Skelly, and he's fast. And if you want to run with him early, you're, you're, you're probably going too fast. I just don't know how you can be absolutely confident he's going to right. be able to come back and run that race. I don't have Good this question. big, you know, going over the Middle East, they don't come back. But coming back in seven weeks, that's pretty quick. They don't usually come back that badly. And I think it's a similar situation with Forever Young. I don't have any... Uh, argument that he's as talented as pretty much anybody, more talented than many in the Derby, but taking him five weeks in the Derby off that race in Dubai, not for me. And he's traveled all around the world. He has, and, yeah. and he's a very good horse. Mm -hmm. But this is a this is a, a road to the Triple Crown that has not worked at all in the past with some very good horses. We'll see how he handles it. A lot of interesting things that we'll find out a lot about over the next few weeks. There is Smoking Hot Kitty, though, and the, the main question of the moment is, can she repeat that last race in the seventh Coming up here from World, let's get a paddock report from Richie. Yeah, Acacia, it's a little bit of a racing oddity in some respects, but all the four, five, and six, Smoking Hot Kitty, Embraceable Gal, and Bella Prince Pesa, all outfitted with extension blinkers on the outside. And we talk about why do they add an extension blinker? The conventional wisdom is, is that horses don't run to where they can't see. That's conventional wisdom. My experience has been different. Uh, I would rather horses have less inhibited vision and give me a little more power steering like a Houghton bit or uh, some other kind of a, a strong bit. But all three of these fillies drawn side by side, outfitted with that extension blinker. Smoking Hot Kitty coming off that big effort, has natural speed, looks great. Uh, really didn't tuck up off of that race and, you know, an effort like that. Sometimes horses lose a bit of weight. They don't look as healthy. I'm not seeing that at all with the four Smoking Hot Kitty. Embraceable Gal looks good showed uh, improved speed I thought last time got it done off the layoff with Trevor McCarthy who stays put here and the six horse Bella Principe say if I was picking horses just on looks and we talk about it, it's like a puzzle right we're trying to fit the puzzle pieces how they look on form on paper and how they look physically physically she is an absolute standout here in the paddock. Bob Claseris is assisting her in New York to incredible work. She's dappled out. This is the first time she is outfitted with that extension blinker. Talking about it, she's trained extremely well in it. It's had the desired effect. So I'm going to watch her warm up. But I got to tell you, again, if it was just looks, give me the six horse all day at a big price. All right, Richie, thank you. First time with that blinker. The other two fillies uh, that he discussed having worn that extension blinker before. So um, that's a look on the left eye, Bella Principessa, just a short cup. And on the right, uh, we'll have that um, extension blinker. There's a good look at it, Andy, where she's fully covered there yeah. in the hopes of keeping her from drifting out. Well, I'm glad to hear Richie likes her, though. I, I think he really just stole it from me, that pick. Meg, I can't trust him at all. You can't trust Richie, is no, that what you said? No, I can't. He's Why? a tricky guy. He's a tricky guy. No, he's tricky, yeah. yeah. Richie's a new grand grandfather. Yes. Yeah, second Nathan, one. Nathan very Richard. Ex very excited. Yeah. Got a picture the other day. It was really cool. Yeah, very exciting. Well, he's uh, he certainly Isabella's favorite person, and uh, I'm sure he will be Nathan's as well. What's not to like? That's right. Getting riders up for the seventh race coming up here as... Um, Smoking Hot Kitty, two to one right now. We'll take a look at her last race. And as you touched on, she ran that 76 by her speed figure. She did run a 78 for her last win, though that was going long on the turf. Right. This was a mile on the dirt. Oh, this was an aberrational yeah. effort for in the dirt, and it was a an overmatched field, and she's controlling on the front end, and those are the kind of performances that often get exaggerated. It's not a killer field here, but it's a much tougher field than she was in last time out. Now, fortunately for her, she's supposed to be the speed again, and you have to imagine Kenner's going to do it again, but this is a big step forward for her. I think two to one is more than fair on her, though. I don't understand all the love for Graceful Rose. Let's meet the rest of the field, starting things off with Miss Fashionista. She ran a big figure two back and didn't run that badly last time. I want to see it to believe it, but she has improved. Out of that same race, here's Annihilate. 
Yeah, I mean, she has run sort of those figures in the mid to low 60s that on her day make her a contender, at least for a piece. Common race here, second there behind Ocean Gateway's Graceful Rose. And that was her best figure last time, and she did beat Irish Jackson, who came back to win, but Irish Jackson beat a very weak field where the only other contender didn't show up. There's your favorite, Smoking Hot Kitty. Yeah, I'm surprised she isn't a stronger favorite, and I'm guessing by post time she will be. She's two to one right now as we look at the five Embraceable Gal. Um, yeah, she dominated a much, much softer field last time. She's a big price if you like her, and I expect to see Trevor be aggressive with her. We'll see if she can run well against tougher. Getting a big warm-up out there, too. Bella Principessa, 9-1, to one, got some good marks from Richie. Yeah, the argument for her is that her best recent races are on dry tracks, and getting back to a dry track perhaps can better back to efforts mm -hmm. that make her at least a, at least a bit of a contender. And to the outside, Miss Christie. Well, I mean, she's second off a tight, not really a layoff, and her race is two and three back are, are fast enough to be competitive. She's a big price at 13 to one. We'll go back to the number five, Embraceable Gal, who did get the win last time out in a $10,000 claiming race. And she, uh, unlike Bella Principessa, Embraceable Gal has worn the extension blinker in the past. Mark Hennig, I know, has kind of experimented with all different types of equipment. So she actually wears the extension blinker and a, a cage bit. And I know that he's, you know, tried cheek pieces, different types of blinkers, everything to try and keep her straight and focused. Well, she ran well last time, far and away the best race that she's ever run, and she did it by being aggressive, but she also did it against a much softer field, and it's hard to see a scenario where she's in front of smoking Hot Kitty here. On the other hand, she ran well enough last time that her 13 to one feels like a bit of an overlay. You could see her even starting to drift a little bit there, but Trevor McCarthy's ridden her in her last couple of starts, knowing to keep her straight, the right-handed urging. She was able to hold off her foe that afternoon, hopefully able to keep a straight course today. For more as horses warm up, let's go back to Richie. Yeah, Kisha, not a lot to change from my first impressions in the paddock. Um, I will say... Well, one tricky thing when you ride a horse with an extension blinker is the brake. Because the outside eye is inhibited with that extension blinker, it's imperative for the rider to have a horse facing directly down the racetrack so the eye that is not hindered with that extension blinker can see the brake clearer. Horses react when the doors open. If their head is turned slightly to the left, they won't see the brake when it comes and they run the risk of braking a, a step slow. Now you have Kendrick Carmouche and Smoking Hot Kitty, Trevor McCarthy on Embraceable Gal. They are you know, journeymen that are very savvy to these kind of things. They have a lot of experience. Uh, they're seasoned veterans. Uh, Alicia Ruiz, who, uh, you know, ha has had a good year up to this date, 49 wins, he, but he's a young rider and maybe doesn't, isn't quite as aware of those things. Now, I'm picking the six Bella Principessa because I've got to go with my instincts. I just like what I saw. I agree with what Andy said about her better races being on a fast track. And I, physically, I couldn't falter. But that is a concern for me. When I see younger riders with horses with this kind of equipment, extension blinkers, if they know how to completely handle it or use it to their best or most effective way, if you will. All right, Richie, thank you. Some good points. We'll see what Bella Principessa can do with apprentice Alicio Ruiz in the saddle, 9 to 5 now on Smoking Hot Kitty. Quickly, Eddie, what about the three graceful rows who's taking some attention as she finished second in a race that several come out of? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure why she's such a short mm -hmm. price. Maybe some are seeing that Ocean Gateway came back. I'll be on the wet track to win and beat tougher. Iris Jackson came back to win, but Iris Jackson rode a very good rail, and there was really only the one other horse in the race for any form and she was abysmal in there so I don't know that she really flattered Graceful Rose and that was the fastest fig that she ever ran. For a trainer's horses run okay but he has very limited success in New York. I think that she's a massive underlay personally. Now I picked her third mm -hmm. but I don't think she should be a similar price to the number four here as she drifts up as the four will come down. With me the six, I don't love the six. I just think eight, nine to one, eight to ten to one sure. is a fair enough price to take on her in this spot. I don't think she's particularly likely to win and I think Richie Brady Brings up valid points, but but price is your guide. You know, I wouldn't bet a nickel on her at four to one in here, but at ten to one, you can accept her shortcomings a lot better. 
seven to two as well on the number one Miss Fashionista who we haven't touched on. She finished fourth in that Ocean Gateway race after a running pretty impressive win two back, but against New York Bread Made and Claiming Company. Yeah, that's that that's that's a very different scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing I would say was that Miss Fashionista from a speed figure standpoint ran well enough last time to suggest her race two back wasn't complete aberration. Sure. But I mean her win two back I don't know where it came right. from because her prior effort at three to five behind Strange, Strange Fruit, who did win recently, but at a lower level, that was a terrible effort. So she clearly has improved in her last two starts. So she's getting to the point where maybe you can trust her a little bit. And obviously she's coming from Todd Pletcher's barn, but I'm still just not sure how good she is. And I wonder if Ocean Gateway just found a very soft field to beat up on last time out. But listen, it's going to hinge. The biggest question is, where you stand with Mokanot Kitty and what you think a fair price to take is that she can run back to her last race. Because she runs her last race, she's probably going to win this race. The question is how confident are she's going to run it and who you think is an alternative. Richie and I find the six to be our, our alternative at 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I would never take the one at 3 to 1 as an alternative to her. She, to me, is going to have to continue to improve, but she could. As far as those one number horses, which... On paper right now, it looks like Smoking Hot Kitty could she is be. One. How important is it to see them kind of validate those performances? Very. And yeah. and and betting against one number horses is a good idea at yeah. short prices. And that's why I didn't want to pick her on top. I do wonder a little bit if it was stretching out at a mile that helped her a little bit. Being aggressive helped her a little bit. So I'm not going to be surprised when she runs back or runs a reasonable facsimile of that race. But it's still tough to take short prices on horses that you look at one race, and then you look at the rest of their form and go, well, she wouldn't even be favored off the rest of her form. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying she has to run her last race, but she better run reasonably close to it. We'll see what she does. Find out momentarily. Loading in for race seven, live at Aqueduct. Here's Chris Griffin with the call. Miss Christie, last to load to the outside. End it. All set. And they're off. Good speed from Graceful Rose from in between horses right towards the front with Annihilate. And at the rail, Miss Fashionista is going to be towards the back end of the field. It's smoking hot. Kitty now has some forward momentum. It's smoking hot Kitty, who's ahead in front, down towards the inside, coming right back, though, is Annihilate. And they get set to come out of the chute. It's Annihilate, who's now in front. Smoking hot Kitty is tracking here from second. Embraceable Gal is comfortable enough from third. Miss Fashionista wanted off the rail, is now four wide up the backstretch, joins a five wide Bella Principessa. Graceful Rose broke with those leaders, is towards the back of that group, and the lone trailer. That's Miss Christie, 23.57, easy opening quarter mile there. Some tepid fractions up top. Annihilate has got the lead, is up by a half length with Smokin' Hot Kitty. No excuses here from second, three wide still, Embraceable Gal. And Trevor McCarthy, they start to move forward now with a little encouragement, three wide. At the rail, it's Graceful Rose. Dropping back was Miss Fashionista, who's under a full drive towards the back end there with Miss, or with Miss Christie and also Bella Principessa towards the tail end of the field. 46.63 for that half mile time. Annihilate is in front. Ready to challenge. Here comes Smoking Hot Kitty. Graceful Rose. Manny Franco. Green Cap looking for a way through. Embraceable Gal is going to hold that position. They're third and fourth. Smoking Hot Kitty. The favorite has the lead. It's Smoking Hot Kitty. Trying to put away Annihilate is doing just that. The main danger looks to be coming from Graceful Rose who's in the clear but Smoking Hot Kitty finding plenty so far. It's Smoking Hot Kitty. Getting closer is Graceful Rose but running out of time. Inside the final 16th, Kendra Carmouche and Smokin' Hot Kitty. The favorite gets it done. Graceful Rose second, then came Annihilate, and a late run, Miss Fashionista in 1 minute 36 and 4. Smoking Hot Kitty backs up that last race. It gets the victory here to make it two wins in a row. Yeah, I was surprised not to see her in front. And Ila got a good aggressive ride from Louis Rivera. But Smoking Hot Kitty is just better than these horses. Graceful Rose did get second, but she never really mm -hmm. threatened. You could kind of see most of the way that this horse was just better than these. Richie, my horse, she was never in a good position, but she didn't do any running in here.
four, three, two, one. Even money favorite. Smoking Hot Kitty gets the victory, making it back to back wins for trainer Horacio to pause Kendra Carmouche in the saddle once again. As you mentioned, Graceful Rose up for second and Annihilate, who was your pace setter holding on for third, but the main running went to the favorite Smokin' Hot Kitty, who gets another victory in here. And who would have thought, Andy, she's found her home on the main track? She has, mm -hmm. but you know, I also think it's fair to ask yourself, maybe she's an improved horse. Yeah. And I imagine Horacio is going to look to get her back on the grass because maybe she's just improved. Mm -hmm. And if she can carry that improvement over the grass, she's still kind of she could be like okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, I bet you he's going to look for a spot um, where he's going to run her. I don't know. He has to decide because um, I don't know does she, what conditions. I guess she doesn't really have. Yeah, she still has her non winners of one New York bred condition. Yep. So maybe Rossi is supposed to look for a non winners of one New York bred race to see if she can improve because she might just be a better horse. And if she transfers that improvement to turf, her her preferred surface, she can actually be competitive. Now a five-year-old mare. Maybe we're getting a chance to see the best of her. She gets the win at even money with Kendra Carmouche in the saddle. There he is. Heading into the winner's circle. And there's a good look at that blinker as well. Up close, you can see the equipment that she's wearing that has been uh, a good assistance to her. Second win today for Kendra Carmouche. She'll bring you prices and more when we come back. Stay with us on America's Day at the Races. We're back on America's Day at the Races. This winter circle lead-in is brought to you by Fazig Tipton's industry-leading selected yearling sales. The July sale, the Saratoga sale, and New York bred yearling sale all taking place this summer. Nominate your yearlings today at phasigtipton.com. Smoking Hot Kitty gets the victory as she makes it back-to-back -back wins and just better than what she was facing today. Yeah, she found the right field to run against. We'll see where they go from here. I, I think that Horacio will probably try her in non-winners of one New York. Wait, wait, no, wait. Um, yeah, non-winners of one New York red race because she has that condition, and I think to give her a shot on the turf to see if she can sort of transfer her new improved talents to the turf, back to the turf. It's the victory there. Four dollar and twenty cent winner in race number seven. Take a look at the late pick five follow along. I'm sure that that's one that probably was on plenty of tickets. Yes, uh, unfortunately for me, been good to know you. The one that nobody had. The less people had tickets was not of mine as well. <laughs> 
17. I spoke out the other short prices, Plus though. Clever guy that I am. Oh, well, you're sharp. We yeah. That. yeah. One more to go, and uh, it's a nice, easy race to wrap up the day. This eighth race, New York Red Maiden claiming 30,007 furlongs on the main track right now. Savage Spirit, the number six for Horacio de Paz as well, is five to two. Horacio and Kendrick looking for back to back wins together. Yeah, I think that she is a very, very dubious favorite in this race, or he is, excuse me. I like the five chance, and the problem for me is that I bet Jansen last time at almost 20 to one. Oh, and, uh, you know, he's going to be a much fraction of that. But if he stays around four to one to five to one, I'll be very happy with that. I think Jansen could be the speed near, and I believe Jansen is going to be very tough to beat. Well, on to the Kentucky Derby conversation, and there's just one more stop on the road to Louisville, and that is the Lexington uh, coming up this Saturday, mile and a 16th at Keeneland, grade three for the three-year-olds. And in particular, this really kind of centers around Hades, Andy, who has 30 points right now, having won the Holy Bowl. He's number 24 on the Kentucky Derby points list right now, and trying to get some last-minute points in to be able to get a spot in the Derby. The best thing that could happen for Hades would be not to get points and not get in the Derby field. He won't be competitive in the Kentucky Derby, and while he's got some talent, I think it would be a real mistake to try to, you know, rush him in there running back two weeks after the Florida Derby. I mean, why didn't they run in the Fountain of Youth if they were so hell-bent on getting points? They skipped that race. Now they're in a hurry. These things don't work out, and I don't believe he's close to good enough. I think the morning line favor, the wine steward, the New York bread, is going to be very tough to beat in this race, and whether or not he uses is a stepping stone of the Preakness, or we see him take a Peter Pan Belmont route. We'll find out, but he's a very good horse, and I don't like Hades at all in this spot. I think he's a nice horse, but I think it's very... I, 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 it's not a decision I would make if he was my horse, but people can do what they want with their horses, I guess. Blinkers going on for the first time as well for Hades, who was not showing his typical early speed last time out in the Florida Derby. Fierceness took the lead, and there was just no catching him. Disappointing effort from Hades. See if he can turn things around. The wine steward, as you mentioned, uh, New York bred, making his first start of his three-year-old season. He was impressive as a two-year-old. I mean, you look at the second place finish behind Locke, who unfortunately is on the shelf now, but second in the Breeders' Fraternity with a 92 buyer as a two-year-old. Nah, he's a good horse, yeah. the wine steward. I think if he, he's ready, he's going to be a handful in there. He drew well towards the inside. He's a forward horse. I think he's going to run extremely well in here and looking back. And we're always rooting for the New York breds. Absolutely. Certainly, as uh, this one, a son of Vino Rose. So as we'll take a look at the Kentucky Derby points leaderboard as of now, we talked about the top two Sierra Leone and Fierceness early on and Hades at that bubble right where El Grande O is also with 30 points and kind of knocking on the door. Obviously, things can change between now and the first Saturday in May. There are always some last minute defections, uh, very last minute defections sometimes result in the Derby winner. Look at what happened with Rich Strike. You just never know how it's going to turn out. Also, a lot can change with the post position draw, but we'll see if some last minute points can be tallied in the Lexington. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's there. It's kind of an odd situation. I, you know, I don't know if this is a, you know, owner's decision or what, what reason to go there. And I think Hades is a nice horse. Yep. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be too disparaging of him. I just don't believe he's going to be a horse that would be effective in the Kentucky Derby, and he's probably better off in his career not taking this route. And, focusing on some other kind of races. He may make his presence felt in other races, mm -hmm. not in the Derby. We'll see how it plays out that Lexington, the final Kentucky Derby points race before we get to the first Saturday in May. Kendrick Carmouche, though, he's had two victories on the card today at Aqueduct. And like it is for many of us, Aqueduct is a very special place for Kendrick. It's the site of his favorite race. We'll learn a little bit more about it after this. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's 
a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better than ever state bread incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreads for more info. Zandon's poetry in motion, big horse, but light on his feet. And he's always showed up and been consistent and been right there with some of the top horses in training. In the Bluegrass Stakes, he showed his determination and his raw ability. It's over. Zandon wins the Toyota Bluegrass. I feel breeders will be really blown away by what a striking, outstanding looking horse he is. There's a big, bold, beautiful world waiting to be explored by you and your friends, of course. But not just any friends, the best of friends. The kind of friends who let you do you. Because in this world, it's positive vibes only. And when you get in the zone here, you stay a while. These aren't just good times, they're the best of times. And your time is now. So come explore. Resorts World. My favorite race is Cigar Mile 2020 True Timber. I know how much my horse loves the sloppy track. I got outside position. You got speed horses and you the horse that can sit right behind them. <laughs> Jack Stinson, he texts me that morning, Kendrick, what do you think? I say, don't worry about it, brother, I got you. My horse break good. I, I want to send him a little bit so I can let him relax a little bit going down the chute. Down the backside, I wasn't worried about the kickback. Even within the 16th of a mile out the gate, a couple of times, a couple of dirt hit him, he didn't even mind. He just shake his head and he just kept running through it. At the 3 8 pole, I asked him and he moved up so sweet. I mean, he was right in my hand the whole time. And once I got to the quarter pole, I just pulled the trigger. You know, I figured if I, I pull the trigger, it's going to be hard to beat me from here to make up the ground on a seal racetrack. When I got to the eight pole and I started axing him, I mean, you can feel the horse responding. True Timber is gonna pull off the upset here in the grade one cigar mile. For my mom, my dad, and, and my wife and my kids, I know how much it meant for them just as much as it meant for me, you know. The fist pump at the wire explains it all. And I'm saying to myself, man, I think this is a grade one. What's this grade one? <laughs> oh, this is my first grade one. Oh, we got out grade one, baby. Coming from Louisiana to win one of these races, the Cigar Mile, and an African American jockey for myself, for my family, for the people that's out there that's seeing this and never thought it could be done. It can be done if you work hard. Kendrick Armouche and his favorite race right here at Aqueduct. And uh, just, you know, the excitement that Kendrick brings every day, his interaction with the fans here at Aqueduct. You, you really you love to see it. To know Kendrick is to love Kendrick, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And that was an exciting time. But but frankly, any time you see Kendrick, it's good to see him. Absolutely. And, and, and we especially appreciate the riders that stay with us all year long. Absolutely. And he's had a very good winter as well. Second in the standings in the winter meet. And like I mentioned, a couple of wins on the card already today. Coming up in the next week, the OBS April two-year-old in training sale will have a chance to see some of the future stars. And, of course, the March sale already in the books. Andy, this April sale is the one that has kind of become the two-year-old sales that a lot of buyers wait for, a lot of people pointing to. It's a monster catalog. The undertax sale still underway, and the spring sale will kick off on April 16th. I think the March sale was bigger this year than it it's was. ever been before as well. Um, and, listen, a lot of good horses have come out of these sales you you know so much more about these sales than I do you've spent a lot of time there look at the horses I'm I more or less listen to you we have a uh, Carson's run is on the sales book for April purchased really? in April last year the horse that you you were you were trying to add a year to his life about uh, <laughs> no, 20 minutes I, ago I here in the, the show the state he was coming back in but take a look at he a couple from of two to four <laughs> according to you a couple, a couple <laughs> impressive freezers Andy this is a gunrunner affiliate to Merrick sales working nine and four if you want to see what we talk about in Ephraim 
just breeze and saying it doesn't look like they're going that fast. That was the perfect example of it. Now, horses have been working faster. I was speaking yeah. to a friend of mine yesterday. And he's telling me there have been some very, very quick works out there. But I agree and watch them, and I, I watch a lot of the works as well. There's a big difference between how they work, working the time yeah. being important, but it's how they work. And, and really lovely breeze. They are going nine and four, which is very quick, but nine and three, even faster. Last year in March, we saw a horse work nine and three and then sell for $2 million. That horse is now named Moof and a grade one winner. He's taking pretty good, Arkansas right? Derby. He's pretty good. Multiple grade well. one winner. Is he multiple? Multiple grade one winners. I'm not sure. Is, I'm not he sure. is. He's a he two-time okay. grade one winner. Yeah. Um, but we'll take a look at one of the two horses that has already worked nine and three throughout the Breeze Show. Again, there was a little bit of a delay due to weather with the Breeze Show yesterday. A little bit more erratic with this Omaha Beach, but you can tell that she is going fast. And the dam, the half-sister to Envoutant, uh, multiple greatest stakes winner as well. Oh, yeah? yeah. Envoutant was... Kenny McPeak. Right. Yep. Okay. This one for Omar Ramirez, Bloodstock. And nine and three is... is incredibly fast for it. Yeah, I mean, were there multiple ones that There's are working that fast? So okay, far. just two, okay. Mm -hmm. yep, that's yeah, that's better. fast. No, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in looking at them and watching those sales work. And I, I think it's also educational. I recommend mm -hmm. to people, it's easy to use the OBS website. And as you start seeing, when, when you, whatever track you're handicapping, when you see these horses coming out of these sales, watch the workouts. Yep. Because horse racing, one of the great things is no matter how much, and listen, I'm, I'm a know-it-all, but I think the great thing about the game is there's so much you can learn about the game. And just by watching the, the workouts and try to learn and try to find things out about them and talking to you, talking to Maggie is a great help to me as well. But, uh, but, but I think it's fun to watch them and mm -hmm. it can't hurt to look at them. Absolutely. And there is a, there's, there's a lot of good resources on there. There's pedigree page, there's photos, walking videos, the breezes, of course, and you have a chance to get to know the horses a bit better. So I'm looking forward to heading down there next week and getting a chance to see some of the future stars of the game. That we'll probably see debuting at Belmont, or I should say not Belmont Aqueduct now, and Saratoga. The we'll be back to Belmont at the Big A in, uh, right. in about three weeks. We turn the page and get ready for the nightcap coming up next here. Race number eight at Aqueduct as this one, a mating claiming for the New York Breds. There's a look at sounds like something I do. Five to one right now. We'll learn a little bit more about him with the paddock report for Mitchie. Yeah, I, I, it took me a minute to figure out the name when I looked at it. Sounds like something I'd do. Um, this horse has had a little bit of problem leaving the starting gate in both his starts. He stretches out now to the seven furlongs. From a physical perspective, and this is true with a lot of Rob Falcone's runners, he just looks outstanding. I mean, just a picture of health, really uh, dappled out, rich resplendent coat. Really like what I'm seeing from the force. So, sounds like something I'd do. The five uh, Jansen or Jansen, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce that, um, looks terrific. He dropped down to the maiden claiming level. He's trained by Andrew Lakeman. People not familiar with Andrew Lakeman. Uh, worked for Tom Skiffington, worked for Nick Zito, probably most notably worked for Alan Jerkins as well. He's a really good horseman. He was injured in a racing accident. He was a jockey at one point. Um, and, but he trains horses now uh, from a wheelchair and does a great job. Uh, horse looks great. Usually always has one or two horses to work with. And this horse just makes a lot of sense uh, to me coming off a nice effort last time when he dropped in for the maiden claiming tag. Seven horse, Alpha Sunny, uh, improved last time. Uh, Jimmy Ferraro does a good job. This horse is uh, outfitted with a slide bit. Um, gives a, a rider a lot more control for a horse that has, has a propensity to want to lug in or out. Um, definitely a, a lot of power steering going on there. And I just thought it was interesting, guys. The, the nine power ten is ridden by Alicio Ruiz. Uh, so you get a five-pound break in the weights, him being an apprentice. And I think races like this are a great opportunity to use an apprentice jockey. It's three-year-olds and up. So horses older, four-year-olds, are going to carry 125 pounds. They're going to give seven pounds to their three-year-old rivals who will carry 118. Now you put an apprentice on, you get in with 113, you're in receipt from five to 12 pounds against all your rivals. Now, it's early in the year still for three-year-olds to be taking on older horses, so they give them that break in weights. And there's two ways to look at it. If a horse is a four-year-old maiden claimer, still hasn't won, how good are they? And a three-year-old, maybe there's more upside, just more natural ability. And I just think you have an opportunity in situations like this to get a big spread in the weights. And that's when I'm more of a believer in weight, when there is a spread. I, I don't think horses are hindered by carrying heavier weights. It's by giving away more weight to their rivals. 
Some great points there, Richie. Thank you. First time starter, Power 10. Yeah, in at 113, for example, the 7 Alpha Sunny, five year old carrying 125. So a big disparity there. As I want to remind everybody that we love those New York breads too. This one, a New York bread made in claiming to wrap up the day. And some exciting news as well as. With a 19% increase in New York bread made in purses in 2026, it pays to have a New York bread. There's never been a better time to have a New York bread foal. So for more information on how to qualify your foal, visit naira.com slash NY breads. Taking a look at the number five, Jansen uh, for Andrew Lakeman. Second last time out. I know you said you liked this horse last time, Andy. You see if we can get him home this time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard. As a, you know, in general, as a horse player, you get one chance. And one of the lessons I learned early in this game that I've kept with me is when you bet a horse like this, at almost 20 to 1, it's your horse. And then the next thing they come back is everybody's horse. The horse is 5 to 2 now, and there's just no value in doing that. I had my chance, and I stupidly didn't have the exacta, which is my fault. Um, I just sort of swung for the fences to get this horse home, and it was a good pick, but it just ended up not paying off. I do think that she's the worst, he's the worst to beat in here, and I think he'll be tough to beat, but at 5-2 to two or 3-1, to one, it's just you're just not getting paid to get that one chance with him. It's a horse who was very wide against a gold rail two back, and a lot of horses have come back from that day that were wide to run significantly better, and I'll sort of expand on what Richie was saying about Andrew Lakeman. I am a big fan. He yes. doesn't have many horses. Uh, he started out with El Deal, who ended up being mm -hmm. grade one winner. Yeah. Andrew knows knows what he's doing, and, and he's a guy who just doesn't get that many chances. But I always give his horses a second look because this is somebody whose horses, they will show up, and, and I think he's a terrific trainer. Couldn't agree more. Very, very sharp, too. So we take a look at Kuroki. You know, this horse's race three back is good enough to compete, and maybe getting back to a sprint on a fast track can help him. I think he's got a chance and a price. He's back at the start last time out as well. There goes the number three, Malibu Margarita. Yeah, drops down significantly, which can help, but mm -hmm. really hasn't done a lot of running. Five to one right now. There's the five. Sounds like something I'd do. The four. Sounds like something four. I'd Sorry. do. I mean, from a speed figure standpoint, the horse ran well enough last time. I don't love the race coming out of, though. There's the five. Jansen, owned and trained by Andrew Lankman. We've covered this one pretty extensively. I believe he's the worst to beat. Five to two right now. So we take a look at your favorite little bit tough to handle. There's Savage Spirit. He's a horse that has been known to drop his rider in the preliminaries. I don't like his last race. I think he's a bad favorite. I think he is very vulnerable here. He should have won last time. There's the seven Alpha Sunny five-year-old still looking for the first win. Well, he ran his best race last time out. Maybe he can build on it. Seven to one right now. Next will be a big price. The number eight triple word score. Even Scrabble players are going to have a tough time <laughs> making find a reason to bet this one. And first time starter Power 10, a new face to the outside. Uh, yeah, he just doesn't really have a lot of pedigree to go on. Dave Donk, not a trainer, wins a lot of first time starters. As good a trainer as he is. There he is with apprentice Alessio Ruiz aboard this one, a son of Weekend Hideaway, debuting in this spot. As we go back over to the six, Savage Spirit, as I had mentioned, he's a, a horse that always has been very tricky in the preliminaries, very tough on the track, and uh, looks like once he's finally been able to put things together in his races, he nearly got there last time, Andy, but nearly as the favorite. I think he should have won last time out. I, I can't make an excuse for him. Yep. I don't love the horse that beat him in there. I just think Jansen's a better horse. And right now the public agrees as Jansen has gone to two to one favorite. Um, I, I, I'm gonna, I would actually try to beat him. I'm gonna play some exactas with Jansen over the two Kuroki and the three Kuroki, how is it pronounced? Kuroki, I believe. And uh, the three I'm, Malibu I'm copying Margarita. Chris Griffin, so if he's wrong, we blame him. He's usually right. Yeah. The number three, Malibu Margarita. We've got a trainer stat for Rudy Rodriguez. What do we have here? He's not great with his maiden special weight to maiden claimer drop downs. He's just a 15% trainer with a dollar ROI. And this is a stat a lot of trainers have good numbers with. These drop downs haven't worked. And looking up just New York breads, he's eight for 55, same 15% with a 97 cent ROI. So these drop downs for Rudy, they're just not usually a big move forward. And this is a stat like turnbacks. You'll often find it be a good stat for some yeah. trainers. For more on horses warming up for the nightcap, let's check in again with Richie.
Yeah, I'll, I'll start down on the inside with the two, Koroqui. Um, this is a horse that's had trouble leaving the gate. He was pinched back last time. Now, it, it, some people think this is probably counterintuitive, but he's drawn inside, and at least he's not going to run the risk of getting pinched between two horses. There is empty space to his inside that, you know, you, you hope that he doesn't run to that empty space young horses and you know horses with uh, you know not a lot of starts have a tendency to flow to empty space like water but at, at least even if he breaks a step slow Eric Cancel has some room to work with or he's not going to immediately get pinched out and lose position he looks terrific Toby Sheets is part owner he is the assistant trainer to Rachel Sells now and you know had been with Steve Asmussen for many years a terrific horseman uh, I thought he was interesting and now I'm going to talk about the horse I'm picking. Another horse has a tendency, or at least in his short two-race career, has not broken particularly sharp to four. Sounds like something I'd do. I just was taken the way the horse looked in the in the paddock. I thought his last race was certainly good enough to make him a contender here. He's stretching out a bit further to the seven furlongs. I hope he breaks a little better now, more experience, and sets up a decent trip. But I, between the way he looked in the paddock and warming up, and I thought his last race was good enough to put him in the frame. He is my top selection. All right, Richie, thank you. A nice six to one price on him as well. Uh, does have to get out of the gate in here too, though, Andy. Last time out, uh, just slow to start, last by several lengths. And uh, it was an improvement from the turf try, but see if he can get into the race a little bit better. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of his. I respect Richie's opinion, but to source racing, we often will disagree. I don't love the race that he's coming out of. He did break a little slowly in there and kind of dropped out. I just didn't see him do any particular running, but as Richie said, he's lightly raced. Maybe he can take another step forward. Jansen, now the favorite at 2-1. to one. Yeah, I think I think he should be favored. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I thought he would be favored when I handicapped the race, to be honest. Mm -hmm. He ran well last time, and I, I think he's supposed to be favored in here, to be honest with you. I think his last race makes him the horse to beat. Um, I was hoping that they would make the six favored, but they did not. 5-2 to two now on the number six, Savage Spirit. Just missed last time out. Rossi to pause and Kendrick Carmouche looking for back-to-back -back wins together after they took the seventh race with Smokin' Hot Kitty. And there is Savage Spirit with the blindfold on. That is typical for him as well. Um, they've, they've done that for him right from the beginning of his career where he's been just difficult and, and very, very much all over the place. And this will just keep him a little bit disoriented and hopefully go straight in, which mm -hmm. he does. Here's he is. Yeah, much better in the yes. gate than he has been previously. So far. So far. Knock Don't on wood. Him. Hopefully I didn't jinx anything. He's five to two. Savage spirit as they load in for the final race of the day. One more time. Let's send it up to Chris Griffin for the call. Triple word score. Jensen. Power 10. Power 10 goes in. All set. Couple acting up towards the outside. And they're off. Kuroki breaks well from the inside draw. There's Malibu Margarita in the early mix. And from the outside, here comes Jansen is in the early fray. And Outside of Jensen, Alpha Sunny is now the leader. It's Alpha Sunny who's a neck in front. Power 10 is about to apply pressure out in the center of the racetrack. At the rail, that's Jensen. These three across the racetrack. Savage Spirit is settled into fourth. Tightly at the rail, that's Malibu Margarita. Now progressing is a challenging fourth. And to the outside of them comes Sounds Like Something I Do. On the very far outside, it's Triple Word Score. And after breaking well, Kuroqui is the trailer. 23 seconds flat for that pressured opening quarter mile. They work into the far turn now. And at the rail, it's Jensen, who's got that pressure right to the outside from Alpha Sunny. Progressing as a tandem there, it's Savage Spirit and sounds like something I'd do. Outside of them comes Power 10, who's under a full drive there in fifth. At the rail, Malibu Margarita. Kuroqui is starting to unleash that kick from the far, far back end of the field. Is still the trailer. It still has eight lengths to make up. They went 46.48 for a half mile time. 
down towards the inside. It's Jensen. Center of the racetrack is Alpha Something. And here comes Sounds Like Something I Do. It sounds like something I do. Alpha Sunny is in between horses. And there's Jansen who's battling on as well. Sounds like something I do. Jansen is very game to the inside as they approach the final 16th. Sounds like something I do, but Jansen keeps fighting on towards the inside. Sounds like something I do gets the victory. Sounds like something I do wins it over. Jansen, who was very game there in second, late run from triple word score in one minute, 25.46 seconds. Sounds like something I do getting the win just up over Jansen. Nice pick, Richie Migliori at six to one. Yep, enough pressure from the overmatched Alpha Sunny did in the number five mm -hmm. Jansen and the four improved a lot. Richie, a good call by him because this was a massively improved effort by this horse to get the job done. Finishing up well on the outside, Jansen. You have to give it to him, though. As you said, pressure early from Alpha Sunny as these two were kind of neck and neck throughout the race. Never really had a breather, and he was kind of the last man standing and then had to try and fend off the closer there as well. Yeah, no, Jansen ran a winning race. He just uh, got horse, lost to horse, just got a better trip. Four, five under the line. Four, five, six, eight, in fact. Huge price with the number eight triple word score checking in fourth. Now we'll take a look at the head on of the stretch because it sounds like something I do. When he was closing, did come in over onto the number seven, Alpha Sunny. It looked like Alpha Sunny was kind of stopping at that point, Andy, but th there was a little bit of a squeeze back at that point. Nah, that was a yeah. minor, maybe they kissed, but nothing. I mean, it would be. Looks like more. I wish he'd come down. I wish he'd come down, but he won't. He, and he shouldn't. <laughs> there is an inquiry posted. Uh, let's head down to Richie for more. Yeah, guys, I mean, watching the head on, it appeared to me the seven Alpha Sunny came out a step, touched the uh, the winner's hip and turned him in a little bit. You know, a horse gets hit on their hip, the tendency is for their shoulder to point in the, in the opposite direction. So in, I, I really put more of the onus watching the head on the couple of times I've gotten to see it now, more on Alpha Sunny who took the brunt of it, but it was him that initiated the first contact. I, I, I don't see that, but okay. I, I thought that the winner came in severely. Um, I, I don't think he should come down, don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm don't. i glad the stewards are looking at it. I believe the stewards should look at these things. It certainly looked a little worse on the, on the pan, but yeah. I think at most they kissed. And the other thing is the seven was done at that mm -hmm. point. So it didn't affect things. And I, I listen, much as I'd like to get put up, I don't think it's a good precedent to get put up on horses, on DQs that shouldn't happen. Um, and I don't believe that we'll see this horse come down, nor May do I think Franco we should. Jumping off as he'll go and make his case, explain to the stewards now. And uh, this was at the point in the race where you mentioned, and, and this is why it's pretty key too, because Alpha Sunny was starting to fade at this point after pressing the pace. And the question the stewards are asking in these kinds of situations are, did it cost the horse a or better order of finish? And it seemed at this point like it wasn't going to. Yeah, I don't even think it's clear that he really fouled him, to be honest yeah. with you. He may have kissed him, mm -hmm. but I mean, it'd be one thing if he came in and he, and he kissed the, the second horse in here. Then you could say, well, you know, I mean, they be beat him by a half a head. You know, maybe it affected things. The seven was done. He was finished. He, he came in and right there, I think it looked worse in the pan. You see those head-ons and we showed it. At worst, it's a kiss. And I just don't. I think it's a terrible precedent. It's one of the reasons I thought the disqualification of Messier was a horrendous decision. It's a bad precedent to be taking horses down, and I don't think you should ever take them down when you can't be sure of whether or not it, 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 really there was con there was contact. And here, at most, there was a very, very mild kiss, and I, I very much approve, appreciate the stewards looking at it. I think the betters, they have an obligation to the betters to tell them they're looking. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that there's a DQ warranted here. And I want the horse to come down, but I don't believe sure. it's going to happen, nor do I believe that it's the right thing to have happen. The transparency. Come on. To see what happened at that point. Um, the inquiry sign posted. Manny Franco aboard the unofficial winner. The number four sounds like something I do. Danilo Graciles Rave on the number seven at that point. Inquiry sign still up. There's Rob Falcone waiting for an announcement of what will take place. Let's go back to Richie. Yeah, guys, and listen, it's always a bad feeling when you're, you know, already passed the wire first and your number's blinking. But me watching this, and I'm 
pretty strong about my opinion here. The seven horse came out as much as the other horse came in. If the other horse came in at all until he got his hip uh, you know, bumped and it turned him towards that horse, the winner, uh, you know, something I do, drifted more later on once that horse was out of there. But I really do think that the seven initiated the contact. And honestly, because the five Jensen drifted a little and he drifted away from him, I just couldn't see a change here. All right, Richie, thank you. As it, the inquiry sign has come down, no change in the order of finish. So number four sounds like something I'd do. Like you said, uh, appreciate the notice for the stewards, the transparency, they took a look at it. But right call to keep Stewards, it. it's one of the things that I've complained about. They often don't tell people they're looking. Gotta tell them they're looking, but they made the right call. No order of finish in race eight. Sounds like something I'd do. Gets his picture taken. Prices when we come back. We're back on America's Day at the Races, brought to you by Naira Bets. You can bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Get started at NairaBets.com. I love this Times Square shot, taking us through the hustle and bustle of New York City. Sounds like something I do gets the victory in the nightcap, able to uh, Pump it out through that inquiry. $15 winner in the last race of the day over Jansen. These two dueling to the wire. And Andy, pick six carryover. 23000 into tomorrow. Yeah, well, to me, I couldn't have been close to hitting this thing, but it shows you no huge prices, but a tough one to put together. Hope that you'll participate tomorrow. A nice carryover to take part in on Friday's card. Sounds like something I do. Trained by Rob Falcone. He's standing by with Richie. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Rob, this was a really nice effort from uh, Sounds Like Something I Do because he broke a bit slow again and really made up a lot of ground. Yeah, he broke a little bit slow again. He's slowly getting there in the mornings, you know, so I thought he'd break a little bit sharper than that. But maybe the more, you know, the more races he gets under his belt, he's learning pretty quick. Yeah, is that what, what, what can you do? Is it just a matter of taking them back to the gate and kind of constantly reminding them? You could. You could do that. I had a horse named Tenure. Took him to the gate every day. Took him to the gate without blinkers, with blinkers. You could look him up. He's known on the Naira circuit, I'm sure. And it, nothing helped. You know, so sometimes they never get it. He was really, he happened to be an exception. He was really bad, you know, breaking out of the gate. But, um, you know, most of them, I think sometimes they get better, you know, as they get more experience. And this was only his third start, so he has every opportunity to get better. What's that feeling like, though? You've just won the race. You're just putting this big effort. And now your number's blinking. I, like, to me, it was one of the worst feelings when I was riding. 
you know, it's definitely not a great feeling. You know, sometimes you, you know more when you're watching it live. I know there was some bumping going on, but once you, I saw the replay, I thought we'd be okay. Yeah, I, I thought so, too. I thought, in fact, the inside horse might have initiated some of the contact. Superstrella, a, a stallion that people probably are not very familiar with, didn't have a lot of foals before, unfortunately, he passed. But it seems like from a small sampling, some pretty good horses. Are... Yeah, he did. He was, he was, I mean, he was bred very, very well, you know, and uh, my dad trusted me to keep him as a stallion for a little bit. Uh, you know, no one had really caught on to him besides us. Uh, he's done, you know, great for us. So he had a couple first time winners, one in Saratoga. Super's lucky lady was here last year. She won first time out. This horse is now a winner. So it's small sample size, but he, I think he would have been a pretty good stallion for New York, but, you know, it didn't work out. Well, that's too bad, but what's working out is your career. You do a great job. Guys, this horse is always look outstanding, and he places them properly, and those that's a tough combination. Good horsemanship and good management. Richie, thank you. It sounds like something I do, getting the win, finding his friends today, and finding the right spot. Well, I can relate one thing. We're both, Rob and I are both long-suffering Brooklyn Nets fans, <laughs> so Rob deserves a little win after the season the Nets had this year. We'll take a look at the pick five follow-along. As, as mentioned, there will be a pick six carryover going into tomorrow, and if you had the late pick five, well done you. $1,400 payoff. Yeah. What was the parlay? 30, 100, uh, about, about 900, about 18, about 2,300, somewhere in there, 2,200. So it paid more than twice the parlay. We need a segment on the show that's Andy does math. Well, it's not that hard. It's just, <laughs> and they're also rough estimates. I love it, though. It's always a lot of fun. I um, hope you had some of those long shot prices today. Well, we, we often talk about the thrills and the excitement that thoroughbreds do bring us on the racetrack. But one of the most important things in our sport is focusing on finding a second career and a new opportunity for horses after their racing days are over. Programs like the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation do just that, in particular, taking horses not able to have a second athletic career. And along the way, they help out a lot of people as well. At the Walk Hill Correctional Facility in Ulster County, New York, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation provides a program that gives both retired racehorses and the incarcerated individuals who care for them a second chance at life and maybe even a second family. I wasn't aware that the program even existed. I had never worked with horses before. I was petrified at first. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not really scared of many things, but when you're next to one of them and they're humongous like that, it's definitely a, a, a challenge. And once they hear me, they come and they just look, you hear that, you see the ears come out, they look, once they see it's me, they come in, they all come. And it's like, oh man, it's, it's like babies, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful, you know. They're locked in most of the time when they're not out with us from 8.30 to 2.30 every day. So those other times when they're inside, they're, they're not themselves. But when they step foot out here at 8.30 in the morning, they change. They're totally different people. I didn't know it was gonna be such an emotional thing. And, and you really do kind of bond with the animals and they look for you to be there for them. It's more love out here. It's more peace, tranquility, solace, anything you want to call it, the epitome of peace to me. It's definitely a game changer for being someone who's incarcerated and always being around grown men, different uh, behaviors, and not being able to actually express your feelings to them. You come out here, you can do that with the animals. I need that. Whatever it takes to get to home to my family, I'm going to try it. But then I got out here, and I met a whole new family. House of family. Yeah, like you said, this is a family. This is a family between the horses, us, like, you know, we bond a lot here. I didn't even know I could drive a tractor. I didn't know I could drive a tractor. I didn't know I could mow a lawn. Anything to make this place look better, to make it better for the horses. At the end of the day, it's all for the horses. All for the horses. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like you're home. Come on, girls. To be able to say to somebody, I have a certificate, like I was successful while I was incarcerated. I may have made a mistake, but I was able to get that second chance while I was here as well. I did get a letter, a letter of assurance saying that um, some people were interested in employing me. So like that's just, 
everything I'm hoping for right now. I talk to them, I speak to them about things that I don't speak to people about in there. <laughs> I can feel like they actually relate to me. And the same second chance that they're given, I feel like I'm getting. For more information, you can visit trfinc.org, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation Second Chances Program. The name says it all, Second Chances, Andy, for horses and people. And I just cannot say enough good things about the program and about what we've seen uh, with the success around the country. No, I think it's a really, really great thing, an opportunity for people to get another chance. And yeah. I mean, obviously, we have an issue with this in this country. And I think to give the prisoners a chance to, to, to learn a new trade, learn a trade, to work with the horses. These are great programs, and I don't think they can be supported enough. I got a chance at the women's facility down in Ocala a couple of years ago to interview a couple of women who were who women who are graduates of the program there at Lowell Correctional and now work uh, with consigners and farms in Ocala. One who became a big part of the operation with Niall Brennan and has had a lot of success. And it's just amazing to see that how they've applied those skills and made a career out of it. No, that's that's really, really great to hear and great to see as well. And I, I think that what the TRF has done involved with those programs, it's a, it's a great, great thing and a great opportunity and Be something sure that we their, need more of. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Be sure to check out their website for more information and how you can support their efforts and upcoming events as well. We'll take a look at our America's Best Racing Race of the Week. It will be Saturday at Oakland Park, the Grade 1 Apple Blossom, a mile and a 16th for the Phillies and Mayors, four-year-olds and upward. And we'll get a chance to see the return of wet paint, Andy, but she'll have to face a Philly, or a mare, I should say now, who is very, very good. Adair Manor coming off a 102 by her speed figure, finishing second in the Boulder Mile. Yeah, I don't think she's going to be the 9-5 to five she is in the morning line. I think she's going to be closer to even yeah. money, and I believe she should be even money. She is simply better than her competition on paper going into this race. And, you know, you've got horses like Wet Paint off a layoff that need to improve, and they need to step forward. She has shown she stepped forward as a four-year-old. She can't learn the La Troyenne because Bob Baffert can't run at Churchill Downs, but she's going to be a handful here. And you have to imagine there's a reasonable chance we'll see her up in Saratoga on Belmont Stakes weekend at the Ogden tips. Very, very talented mayor coming off that big effort. She's a grade one winner as well. 7 4 15. Lifetime Adair Manor, the daughter of Uncle Mo. We'll take a look at Taxed. Definitely a bit of an overachiever. This filly who won the Black Eyed Susan uh, was initially claimed by her current connections for 50000 back in 2022. And we see her coming off a win most recently in allowance race at Oakland sprinting. And now she'll stretch back out. Yeah, and she really did run well to win this six furlongs. But I think it's one of the reasons we, we like speed figures. You know, this looked like a very impressive win. And it was visually, but she only got an 85 buyer. Now, she probably can improve going longer, and she's a neat horse. But once again, she's going to have to get a lot faster and hope that a dairy minor manor doesn't run her race if she's going to beat her. And I like Tax. She's a very neat yeah. horse, but she's going to have to improve to beat the favorite. Take a look at the Louisiana bred who will break from the rail. You mentioned El Deal. This one by El Deal. Actually, a five year old mare coming out of a Louisiana bred stakes victory. She was second in the Houston Ladies Classic behind Bellamar, who she'll rematch with in here today. And uh, once again, an intriguing kind of new face in this group. Yeah, she's a tr really cool horse, $5,500 yearling, made $1.3 million, Louisiana bred. She can't win this race on paper, yeah. but she's a very, very cool horse. Yeah, we like to see those types, and we'll see what will happen with wet paint first race uh, since the Breeders' Cup distaff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's will be interesting to see if she can improve her Brad yeah. Cox because she needs to do a lot of improving. She's always been a nice horse, but she's just never been that fast. And she's going to have to get a lot better as a four year old if she's going to be able to run competitively in the upper echelons of this division. I'm curious to see if Cherise DeVos horse at some point is going to get, get back to the kind of good form she had when she upset the Molly pitcher. Shotgun hottie. Yep. Yeah, to the outside. As this is a horse who she won the Molly Pitcher very impressively last year. And a couple of disappointing efforts so far this year, but trying to turn things around as well. well she beat search results that yep. day. And uh, there's no search results necessarily in here, though. A Dare Mayor is going to be a handful and going to be a heavy favorite. Looking forward to that. Our America's Best Racing Race of the Week, the Apple Blossom, coming up. As that'll do it for us today. For Andy Serling, I'm Acacia Kamal, and all of our team, thanks for joining us 
on today's program on America's Day at the races. We saw some nice performances today as well in race number six. Control Temper was the best in there. And then we saw Smoking Hot Kitty in the seventh. Go back to back. She's found her form and found her friends. We'll see you tomorrow here in New York. We have a pick six carryover. We'll be back our next show on America's Day at the races. FS2 starting at 1 p.m. We'll see you then. Good night, everybody. War Dancer, New York's leading turf sire again in 2023 with standouts like Barrage at Saratoga. Here's Barrage with a final surge. Barrage got him. War Saichi dominant on the dirt at Finger Lakes. War Saichi has scampered well clear. War Saichi all the way with the top spot. And Danzig Queen on the tap of the surface at Woodbine. And Danzig Queen will come away and win by a length. Consistently producing winners on dirt, turf, and synthetic. War Dancer, proud to stand in New York. Country Pick 5 combines the best racing from New York with top races from around the country in one bet. Find it in your track venue and play every race day. Races are posted weekly at Naira.com slash cross country. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month.